Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just had to call the meeting to order. It's uh, time is now seven o'clock. If I can get tell the councillors to turn on their cameras, then you pop up to the top of my screen, and I can see what's going on. Uh, as I call the meeting to order, uh, this is a regular council meeting of February the fourteenth. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territories of the Coast and the Strait Salish peoples, specifically the Lekwungen speaking people known today as the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. At their connections these lands continue to these day to this day uh, up first we have uh, approval of the agenda uh, this is for the regular council meeting uh, can i get a motion to approve uh moved and seconded any discussion changes uh, go ahead councillor patterson yes mayor thank you uh for the question i i would uh with council's um permission and consent uh, request that we move item 13.1 to 9.1. 13.1 9 to 9.1. Um, so, uh, sorry, so the 9.3, is that what you're thinking of? To move right. it after the, it, it, the yeah, reports and be, memorandums? It could be 9.3. Um, so, uh, so that's moved. Is there a seconder to make that change? Seconded, thank you. Um, my only observation on that is uh, that item is uh, subject to public input. So we may be, and it's right at the end of the agenda, people may be coming in to the meeting late anticipating to speak to that. And so we may run into the issue that people may show up to speak to it and, and it may have been dealt with already. So that'd be my only caution with that change. So I'm not sure I'd recommend it, but uh, it is your item on the agenda, Councillor Patterson, as your motion. So, um, is, if that's something you wish to do, I can make. I can call the question on the on the change. Is it is it something you wish to make that change? It is, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on the change? Uh, okay. So the motion right now is to change to shift item number thirteen. Just make sure I got that number right. Uh, number thirteen point one. Uh, the notice of motion uh, to 9.3. Um, go ahead, Councillor Ney. This is to speak to the motion, Mr. Mayor. I, you know, the last time this was on the agenda, it came very late in the agenda. I think we were at almost 10.30 at night and uh, many people who did want to speak to it had faded away uh, because of uh, it being so late in the agenda. So um, I, I think it uh, seems reasonable to me to move it up to a reasonable hour when it's more likely that uh, um, more of the public, if they choose to uh, uh, be involved and have some say in this uh, motion can uh, do that at a reasonable hour. So I'll be voting in favor. Uh, I don't see any other hands up, so I'm ready to call the question. All those in favor of making the change? And those opposed, that carries. So that is item number 13.1 is now 9.3. Any other changes to the agenda that people wish to see? Not seeing any, I'll call the question then. All those in favor of the amended agenda, move uh, and the, uh, sorry, and opposed, unopposed, that carries. Thank you. Uh, we have adoption of the minutes of January 24th. We can do both regular council meetings of the 24th. Moved and seconded. Other changes or corrections to those minutes? Not seeing any, I'll call the question. Then all those in favor of adoption, any opposed, none opposed. Moving on to receipt, uh, we can do 4.1 and 4.2 together to receive those committee minutes. Moved and seconded, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, any opposed, none opposed, that carries. Uh, rise and report, we just have the rise and report as laid out here, so we can just move that rise and report. Moved and seconded. That would be discussed just for information for the public. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, we have mayor's remarks. They'll be fairly brief today. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you for sharing your uh, this day with uh, with the in service of the public. And uh, to all the public who are attending as well, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I wanted to just point out a few things. There's a lot going on in the community, and I wanted to make sure people were aware, since a lot of it is virtual and may not uh, be that uh, visible if you're not paying attention. So uh, first up, we have walking tours underway right now for the infill strategy. Um, there was a number that happened over the weekend, and there's more coming up the coming weekend. If you go to the connect.oakbay.ca slash infill, uh, connect.oakbay.ca is our general place for all public input, and you'll find the information there if you wish to register. 
Um, there's also a pedestrian survey on right now for the pedestrian master plan, uh, also at the same site at connect.opay.ca. Uh, and I also want to point out that the police uh, board is undertaking its strategic planning process. And so there's a public input uh, survey available for that as well. So if you're looking for spending some time to give input on the community, this is a good time to be doing it. Um, also just a heads up that the tree replacement on Oak Bay Avenue uh, is just waiting for some, uh, some changing of temperature so we can undertake some of the concrete work simultaneously. Uh, we expect that uh, tree by tree that work will be done to replace the uh, the swelling sidewalks uh, starting probably in uh, later in February or early March and that'll be done one tree at a time so just in case anybody's wondering what's happening with those trees uh, that's what's underway right now uh, so that's it for my remarks and I'm happy to move on to the next item on the agenda we have a presentation tonight uh, where we've invited um, Mr. Horth the general manager of Crest uh, to talk to us a little bit about what's happening at that place. Now, uh, Councillor Patterson, you're the uh, liaison to Crest. If you wanted to uh, introduce Mr. Horth, it's probably appropriate. And then, uh, Mr. Horth, you have 10 minutes to present, and we'll take some questions if any ha anybody has them, and then uh, move on from there. So welcome. Uh, thank you, Councillor Patterson. Why don't you go ahead and introduce Mr. Horth? Yes, thank you, Mayor. And I am, am very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Horth, the general manager of, of Crest. Um, Mr. It, it's, it's hard to relate to him as, as Mr. Horth because I'm so used to calling him Gord. So if I slip, please. Uh, but uh, Mr. Horth has uh, been in the leadership position with Crest for many years and under uh, his direction. And he has uh, just, in fact, um, signed to stay on with the organization to lead us through some of these exciting changes that we're going through. But under Mr. Horst's leadership, the, uh, the organization has really um, grown um, in, its, in the professionalism with, it, with how it manages and uh, analyzes its business. And uh, Mr. Horst really provides great leadership to the team. It's a dynamic team. I, uh, I can't comment highly enough on their, their professionalism, um, their ingenuity at, at rolling out at the work and uh, and providing efficiencies and effectiveness that are that save our membership uh, financially. And certainly it has been my pleasure to work more closely with Mr. Mr. Horth and other members of uh, the organization, both technical members and other members of the board to uh, do the analysis for the project that Mr. Horth will introduce to, to Obey Council tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to Gordon. Sorry, Mr. Ward. <laughs> well, uh, th thank you, Mayor Murdoch and, and Council, and uh, thank you for the uh, very kind uh, introduction. Um, uh, I've just got a short presentation. Um, uh, the materials in your agenda package, and there's some uh, annual general meeting material that will come uh, to the shareholders in May that I just wanted to talk to uh, briefly about and answer any questions at, at the end, uh, if, if I might. So. Um, some of you are quite familiar with, with Crest, um, you know, that Mayor Murdoch has attended meetings in the past and of course uh, um, Councillor Zelka was, was a director for a while and we've, uh, we've had Councillor Patterson on the, um, as the, as the OP representative for some time now and chairs our finance committee uh, meeting. So um, I think most of you know a, a little bit about the history of Crest. Uh, the most recent news really that, that you know, that I think is laudable is, is a, a nice transition uh, to a new platform um, that was finished in 2020 uh, across the board. And I think the interesting thing about it was that we decided strategically to um, embark on the same platform that Ecom had, had rolled out a few years before that. And in fact, we share a core, so we're able to back one another up in the event of something catastrophic, which is always good, I guess, in emergency communications. Um, but that partnership has, has served us well um, going forward, uh, sharing sharing technologies and strategies, training, um, and the two outfits work quite well collaboratively. Just uh, not not to bore anyone, but the, the numbers, the, the metrics um, are daunting. Uh, it's, it's a busy it's a busy system. Um, over six million transmissions a year, uh, just under three thousand radios in service. I think the interesting metric that, that just called your attention is one busy for about 80, 80 five hundred calls. When we get a busy uh, and that someone wants to use the radio and needing a go ahead tone, so once in every eighty five hundred they'll get a slight delay. 
Tuesday under a second. On our old system, it was about one in, in 700 calls. We would get a, a slight delay, whereas the, with the more, uh, with the additional capacity in the system, it's dramatically better. And with the, the new digital technology, the audio clarity is better, as is the coverage. We deployed more transmission sites for other regions. Um, really, uh, when we did our strategic plan, I noticed um, that that was a topic earlier on. The mayor mentioned uh, with, with your police. Um, in our 2020 strategic planning session, we identified that uh, we, we needed a post-disaster building to house our equipment, spares, and our personnel. That was our ma major risk identified in, in our uh, strategic plan. Um, right now we have a warehouse, it's not post seismic, uh, where most of the spares and the staff are there. We also have, we rent a warehouse down the road. It's just, it's just a warehouse and our um, master site itself is in a post seismic building. It's in the West Shore RCMP. But we believe housing all of that critical infrastructure under one, one building uh, is, is a critical next step for our organization. Um, I don't have to tell you, but uh, you know, we just um, faced all kinds of um, unbelievable uh, weather and, and other kinds of disruptions um, in the last couple of years. Um, I've lived on the island all my life. I, I can't believe the frequency of, of, of significant events that, that have occurred. Uh, and I think we need to be prepared for that. We are on an island, as you all know, and uh, we are often on our own to uh, do recovery, um, help one another, and we think that uh, housing some of this critical infrastructure uh, in a post-disaster building is is really important. And I, and I believe that we have uh, exercised and shown um, that we have fiscally prudent and can manage our own affairs. Our, our budgets for the new P25 network uh, came in on budgets over four years. Um, often the technology, you do have overruns. So I, we were happy to, to say we didn't. Um, and we delivered delivered an, an outstanding, I think, network that will serve us well for the next 15 years. Um, so really, looking forward, we believe that we can we can bring this building uh, to fruition within the existing framework of our user levies. So uh, we we looked at a 2.9 percent increase to capture not only the building, our regular infrastructure and investments in uh, in the network and other key components um, throughout the region over the next five years um, and be able to make us be better business ready going in the future to be able to serve our first responder community. We do have strong agency support from both police, fire and ambulance and some of those um, excerpts you see uh, on your screen. Uh, there's more in, in, the, uh, in the news release and I, I believe every police and, and fire chief is a, is, a, is a strong supporter of this project. So really, uh, at the key points really going forward, hopefully, is we the board has authorized us to secure a parcel that we could build on. Um, the agreement is with uh, Seacliffs Properties. It's City Gates Development. It's in Langford, sort of behind Costco. Everyone knows where Costco is. Um, preliminary uh, building estimates. We've had a class D estimate uh, done twice just to make sure that our, our figures are correct. It's about 16 million to pull off the off the project. And we'd be boring them with the bulk of the financial um, uh, funds obviously to the MFA as we have in the past. And um, we believe the building will serve us well for the next 30, 35 years um, going forward. Just a, a picture of one of our, our transmission sites. This sits in uh, High Rock Park in Esquimalt. Got a few of these throughout the region. And just an artist rendering really of the, uh, of the proposed building. Um, so there, there is some information in, in the package that you've received in terms of would be going to the annual general meeting, it goes into some depth in terms of why and a little bit more detail, but uh, I'll just open up for questions to answer any, anything you might have. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Horth. Uh, I see Councillor Ney, you had your hand up. You're muted if you're speaking. Sorry, that was from before. Okay, yeah, no worries. Uh, are there any questions, uh, any questions of Mr. Horth at this time? Thank you very much for the presentation, Mr. Horth. Uh, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, I do have a question from Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, um, Mr. Horth, for the, an excellent presentation. I just want to ask that the picture you showed at the end kind of intrigues me. It shows a fire truck uh, apparently, apparently coming out of your building. Uh, is there plans to 
have a fire station as part of this uh, post-disaster building? No, no, there, there isn't, uh, um, Councillor Zalka. Uh, it was a rendering at, at our current building. Um, I can't remember if you've been out to the, to the old building, at, at, um, but we have a, a, a fairly massive base so we can pull in fire trucks to outfit okay. with um, with either digital vehicle repeaters or just a, a mobile and, and their portable radio so that it's undercover. So uh, the new building would have a similar base so we can access lar large equipment. Um, so it's just, it really is, um, a rendering but but we we would hope to be able to deploy something along those lines so we can service those big rigs uh, uh well thank you very much and i i, I understand that, that 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 introduces the uh the unique uh, i guess requirements uh for for the facility um i, I was hoping that maybe uh, you know i understand ecom a few years ago uh, built their own uh post-disaster sort of building i was hoping maybe at some point maybe crest and ecom could get together since they we support each other so strongly already but uh, it sounds like their building uh, wouldn't meet the requirements. Mr. Ward? Yeah, so um, with with, uh, with Ecom, they, when they first came out of the gate, they built a post-seismic uh, building um, as, their, as their headquarters. They, they have long-term plans of locating a second one, uh, geo-redundant, so it's not in the same vicinity uh, further across um, uh, Greater Vancouver area. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they've been a good partner. You know, we really share a lot of information. The technical crews get along well. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, choosing the same technology platform, the same provider, Motorola, uh, was a wise decision back in 2015, 2016, and has served us well going through uh, today and in the future. So. Thank you. Phone, you can't get out of it. Eh? Thank you. Thank you. Um, th thank you for that. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And through you, um, Chair, to Mr. Horth, thank you very much for the presentation. It is really interesting. I, I just have a hypothetical question, whether or not it's relevant or not, but in the recent occupations that we've seen, that we have seen in other provinces and Ottawa specifically, would, Chris, would Crest have a role in something like that? Um, just out of curiosity, would, would you, I'm, I'm assuming you would be involved through emergency services perhaps, but I just wondered if if you foresee a time when when Crest might have a role in something similar. And thank you very much, Mr. Horth. That's an excellent question. Um, so so we provide emergency communications for about fifty first responder agencies. So uh, where we would get involved in something like that, uh, we already we already have in similar circumstances. So when the prime minister comes to town, or a dignitary, or um, Anyone in terms that that requires some special attention by the police, both undercover or just uh, in in uniform, uh, we we often supply additional radios, and we do um, often we do radio programming on the fly to uh, give them additional secure encrypted channels so that they can carry on communications. Obviously, if they're coming from Ottawa, their radios are work fine on the Ottawa system, um, so they need to be reprogrammed um, and. We have that ability to do it on the fly over the air rekeying these days on the new system. So we're often called upon uh, on large demonstrations or in Canada Day celebrations or, or protests, uh, perhaps not as large as the Ottawa one uh, we've recently seen, but we have the capability. In fact, uh, we, we keep a, a cache of uh, readily programmed radios just in case something happens and the radios can be deployed. So um, often the RCMP will come down from from Nanaimo uh, when the RCMP need additional resources and uh, they move on to our system. They're already reprogrammed, they're already back programmed all, all on the island of the RCMP radio so they can um, manage affairs if they're required. So so we, we certainly do that kind of work and I, I expect we will continue to do that work in the future as uh, the, the unsettled times that we live in, unfortunately. Thank you very much that, and that's reassuring. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Thank you, Mr. Horth. Uh, Councillor Nate, your the hand is still there. Is that intended to for comment or question? Nope, just coming down again. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And, uh, and one thing that, that may be of interest to councillors and Mr. Horth can speak to that. I know it was of interest certainly to our emergency personnel here in Oak Bay was the number of uh, calls that, that the it, we take on the, rate, the Crest radio system actually that originate from U, the University of Victoria. So uh, many people aren't aren't familiar with the fact that 
uh, that is another service that is provided as part of the system. And Mr. Horst, do you want to speak to that briefly? Just, just, just briefly, Your Worship. Um, no, Ubic Security has been particularly busy in the last couple of years, particularly this this fall session with uh, the, the situation we find ourselves in. So, um, having Ubic Security being able to talk seamlessly to both the Obey Police and Sandwich Police, which have joint jurisdiction there, as well as the other first responder agencies like your fire departments and the ambulance, it has already been critical. Um, and I, and I know Ubic Security values uh, that service, if, if you will. So. That we really are fortunate um, having a system like ours. It, it's only Greater Vancouver and uh, and Greater Victoria that have a similar uh, interoperable system to serve their first responders in BC. Um, so we, we are very fortunate, and with the new new technology, it's even better than it was in the past. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horth. Uh, I don't see any other hands up in terms of questions, uh, Councillor. Uh, Patterson, you indicated you wish to just make a, a, a follow-on motion to this. Uh, for maybe you can just move for seat at the, at the presentation first. I'll move for seat. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the receipt? All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed? That carries. Thank you. Yes, Mayor, if I may, might continue. Um, I would like to make a motion that whereas Crest Board of Directors has determined that development of a post-seismic master site facility is vital to ensuring the region's critical public safety communications network can withstand a natural disaster, and further that the financial projections validate that the project can be undertaken without increases to user levies, be it therefore resolved that Obey Council support the post-disaster building project and authorizes the Crest Director from Obey or his or her pro proxy designate to endorse the project and associated borrowing at the next share shareholders meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, is there a seconder for that motion? Move and second it. If we don't, I'm just going to go to staff to make sure I'm clear on the on the appropriate process here. Normally, we have a notice of motion, but for things arising like this, I think it's uh, it's okay for us to deal with these kind of things uh, since it's a non-binding authorization. In any case, um, Ms. Uh, I'm not sure who I should go to here. If Ms. Morden or Ms. Williams uh, could just speak to the um, to that process. Is this is this okay for us to deal with this motion as it is? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, it would be in order for that motion to be considered. It is germane to the topic, and it's something that Council will likely consider doesn't require further public input. Great. Thank you very much for that clarification. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the report uh, actually presented by uh, uh, two cross directors prepared by, by uh, Gord Horth, um, uh, it's a very similar recommendation. Uh, I'm, I just wanted to ask uh, the, uh, the, the maker of the motion whether uh, that was the basis for this motion and whether there's any fundamental differences between what's already written here and what was put forward by Councillor Patterson, please. Sure, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you for that question, Councillor Zalka. We, um, at, at our working committees, of course, look at all of this and we were, we were asked, we had a request from um, our board of director members to in fact provide some advice that might guide that discussion. So that is exactly where I took uh, that from. Um, and uh, my the motion that I have presented uh, aligns with the intent of that and there is no significant differences. Great, thank you. Don't see any other hands popping up here on that. So I'll happy to call the question then. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. That carries. Thank you very much. Uh, any other items arising? I don't imagine there are. Thank you very much, Mr. Horth, for the presentation and for answering questions. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Valentine's evening. <laughs> All right. Have a good evening. Uh, moving on to number 8.1, we have the infill housing strategy. We have Ms. Uh, Jamison here to kind of provide an overview. I think a little bit of what's been happening, but also uh, some uh, to bring back to this table, we had asked for some um, some potential uh, additional add-ons to, to the approach. So welcome back, Ms. Jamison. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Nice to be with you this evening. So as the Mayor mentioned, I'm here tonight to provide Council with some additional information on optional and communications and engagement activities for the infill housing strategy. Just bear with me for one moment. I'm going to share my screen um, because I have a presentation with some visuals.
I'm assuming everyone can see this. We can see it perfectly. Thank you very much. Perfect. So before I provided that update on um, optional communications and engagement activities, I just wanted to take a moment and share with council some of the communications and engagement activities we've completed today. So uh, first and foremost, we created a project website, which is right here. We launched a photo and neighborhood story challenge on social media. We placed ads in Oak Bay News promoting the project, and we also distributed posters and postcards uh, at key destinations in the community, including commercial businesses and the recreation centers. We published an initial public survey, which has received over 150 responses since it was made available last Monday. And we hosted three neighborhood workshops last weekend with close to 30 participants, including some members of council. And uh, in terms of the demographic profile of the workshop participants, it included renters and homeowners, those who have lived in the community for decades and some relative newcomers. And I think the project team would say that the conversations were all very respectful, engaging and insightful. So future engagement opportunities include additional workshops on February 26th, a focus group with builders and designers, presentations to Oak Bay committees, in-person and virtual design fairs, and a final public survey. So that's all to come in the next few months. So I'm here tonight to talk about these optional add-ons for engagement and communication um, that council requested additional information for on uh, the January 10th meeting. So these include an animated video, project swag, installations, a project initiation video, and a mass mail out option. So we didn't see these optional add-on engagement activities as a prerequisite to a successful project. They represented a range of ideas for council to consider in addition to the engagement activities we already have planned. So I just included some example images from each of the type of engagement activities we're talking about, but I did want to flag these images are just examples and any engagement activities we did, we'd need to customize them for Oak Bay. So the first one I wanted to share with you is an animated video and it could look something like this, which was recently used by the city of Victoria for their missing middle initiative. The project team estimates this would cost approximately $15,000 to create. The next is Project Swag. So for this, participants in engagement activities would be given a tote bag and it would have a map of Oak Bay and the project branding. So 50 tote bags would cost approximately $1,000. Block installations could be smaller scale 3D models like this, medium sized models, or even a photo exhibit from early entries in the photo challenge. The cost ranges, um, but Dialogue has suggested we put aside 8,000 for this and it depends on materials used. A project video would include an introductory screen with the project name, tagline and logo, and then a video prepared by the district, which would include a project update by the mayor for a cost of approximately $2,000. And then finally, a mass mail out could either be a standalone postcard, so similar to what we already have, or a newsletter with a within a district envelope that would be sent to all Oak Bay residents and that would cost approximately $10,000. So within the council report, starting on page three, there's a table on each of the additional engagement activities, which has a description cost and then some staff analysis to go along with this presentation. So staff recommend including the project tote bag the project video and the block installations as additional simple and cost-effective engagement tools. And these could be funded within the existing communications and engagement budget. We're also recommending deferring the decision to include the animated project video and the mass mail out until we've completed the first and second rounds of public engagement. So we can determine if these more complicated and costly additional engagement tools would be beneficial at that time. And um, staff will be reporting back to council in spring with a summary of public engagement to date. And it's at that time that council could provide direction to include the animated video and mass mail out as engagement activities, um, which would be included in the final round of engagement. So that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jamison. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Breathwaite. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick question, um, Ms. Jamison, for the, well, thank you for the tour on, or the, the work up on the uh, weekend. That was great, by the way. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, but um, the question I have from your report is the block installations, would they, where would they, um, you say that they'll be in the lobby of Municipal Hall or a library or recreation center. Um, and then could we choose other locations as well, like at school or something like that? Or, you know, where is it that you would highly recommend that we put those, could we have a place outside, I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah, great question. And I think we would be looking for places that have high foot traffic. And so maybe it is the recreation centers or um, the schools would make sense. I'm actually really excited about a potential collaboration with the woodworking shop at Oak Bay High. Something like that is something that the team has brainstormed. So maybe there's a possibility to include a partnership there. So I think we're looking, if council approves the block installations, we'd be looking for that type of um, input and sort of partnership opportunity. That, that sounds wonderful. A partnership like that, I think, would be great. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Green. Thank you very much, Chair, and through you to Ms. Jamison, thank you very much for the ex excellent presentation. And I've heard some really good feedback on the workshops that you've held so far. I think I'm going on Saturday the 26th. Um, just a question on the swag. Um, and I'm not... <laughs> I'm not trying to be, um, you know, raining on anyone's parade at this point, but I'm just wondering what is the cost of the swag uh, as part of the project? It's just a question. And the only reason I ask the question is that I know sometimes people are sensitive about how we spend um, taxpayer dollars. And I, I was just wondering if, if the swag was an absolute essential or um, a nice to have. So it's just a question. I'm not asking for, you know, a, a rationale necessarily, but I just wanted to get your feedback on that. What was your experience with other communities? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Ms. Jamison? Yeah, thank you for the question. I would see it as a nice to have and optional and all of the items before you, we are, as a project team, are considering kind of optional engagement. Um, it is something that I've done in previous projects, but, but certainly would be considered sort of an extra. Um, outside of kind of the core set of activities that we have in front of you with the walking tours and the survey and the design fair. Those are sort of pretty standard um, communication and engagement tools. And then some of these ones before you are a little bit above and beyond um, and, and not necessary, but could be an interesting way to sort of reach different audiences or promote the project or be seen as innovative. And um, the total cost was a thousand dollars for 50 tote bags. So that's graphic design, the printing, and then the actual tote bag. Yes, thank you. Just to follow up. Um, and I really appreciate that. And I'm not really quibbling about the, the cost. I guess it's more about the perception at a time when people are coming out of COVID. Um, there have been um, some real hardships economically, both for the local economy and generally in the workforce. So it was just about the perception of, of the item. And I, you know, I personally think it's it's great, but I'm just wondering in this context whether it would be better not to do that. And that's just, just my own personal, um, you know, just being sensitive to the needs of the community and, and how they might feel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Are they going looking for questions at this point or of uh, Ms. Jamison? Don't see any. Can I, I just, uh, for my clarification, um, the mailing and for unaddressed ad mail, you know, I was just checking my numbers that were spent sort of during the campaign for that to so getting all of Oak Bay and it was about $2,300 for printing costs and and mailing costs uh, for those. So I'm just wondering why the uh, why the $10,000 number, is that for directed mail um, to get to make, to make, to be sending it to all of the specific addresses or is it is that is there something there in addition that I'm not clear on? Thank you for the question. It is a combination actually. So it's the, the printing of, um, if we did a postcard version, it's the cost of that type of product that would be a little bit higher. Um, and then the other option was actually just an eight by 11 um, standard issue sort of white piece of paper that was more of a newsletter style. Um, and it's the 
the addressing of that version, like needing to put it in a district envelope, would increase the cost. So there was two different options and each of them when we had them costed out by the third party who would actually be distributing them via Canada Post, they both came out to around the same cost. And it was, I believe, it's around 11,000 addresses that this would go to. And so that was the quote they provided for those two different versions. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I, I might doesn't it doesn't line up with my my experience on the costing, but I appreciate that there's a, there's add on cost for just managing the whole process. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, I don't see any. Uh, oh, go ahead, Councillor Name. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, um, it, I was just wondering about the uh, project video. If you could provide a bit more detail, both. Uh, I'm wondering once it's uh, been developed. Uh, how do you implement it? How do you promote the video? Where does it get um, posted, I suppose? Or how does the public get access to it? And the second quest, part of the question is, in terms of that uh, particular intervention, it, it sounds like what you're saying is that uh, its purpose is to promote the project and to show council leadership. And I'm just wondering, I you know, it may be difficult to know how important that is until we get there. And uh, I, I do hear that you've said that these are add-ons. So, um, you know, it's not a lot of money, um, but, but maybe you could just, maybe I could just ask you to expand your thoughts around that particular intervention. Sure. So in terms of your first question, I think what we would see is that we would post the video on the project website. I think we would use uh, it for social media. And then I think for any upcoming engagement opportunities, so I'm thinking the in-person design fair or the virtual design fair, that could be sort of an introductory video that we might use. Um, and really just, again, a different a different way of reaching people with a video instead of an email or a newsletter or a walking tour, just another option for, for sort of targeting a, a broad cross-section of residents. Um, so I think those were the initial thoughts. And I think um, I'm not as familiar with sort of what you've done in the past, but it sounds like that's something that's been done before. So perhaps consistency across different projects, um, providing a brief sort of project video made by the district. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nay. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you very much for the, uh, the presentation of this. Ms. Jamison, I, I too did enjoy the, um, the walking tour on the weekend. I think that it was, um, uh, it was good uh, opportunity to hear directly from, from members of the community um, with a variety of uh, with commentaries. So I think it, it I certainly um, found it to be very worthwhile. On the these um, uh, add-ons that are um, optional, so listing um, and perhaps you can just confirm if uh, if I'm correct. And the intent of all of these the, the add-ons is to inform of the, the the project that we are looking at at infill housing, rather than to gather more data from the community. Is that, is that a, a, an appropriate interpretation? Thank you, Councilor Patterson. Ms. Jameson? Yeah, I think that's correct. I think we're looking at these option as more um, promotional and being quite strategic of when we use them. And so we've actually got quite intensive communications and engagement right now. And so our suggestion was perhaps later on in the project, maybe when we actually have a draft in front of us or some key directions, strategically placing some of these additional uh, optional engagement activities could be a way to really promote some of those key directions that are emerging or recommendations that have um, come about as we've gone through the process. So I think that's why we're, we're suggesting doing them a little bit later on, um, just to enhance what we are already proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Patterson. I don't see any of their hands up, so I think we'll just, uh, if we can just get a, a motion to receive the report first, moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed, thank you. And then um, maybe we can just take the three proposals in order, and then if there's anything else anybody else wishes to add, uh, we can consider those. Um, 
So I'll just take that as a, as a piece. So if, if that's uh, amenable to council, um, or if there's another approach someone wants to take, do it. Uh, they need someone to make a motion at this point uh, to move us forward if people wish. Go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. So you'd like him separated out the swag, the video, and the installations in separate motions? Well, if you want to make those three together, that's, I can always separate them if okay. people wish to see them separately. Uh, okay, um, then I will make the motion that Council approve the addition of project, project swag, uh, project video, and installations as additional engagement tools for the infill housing strategy and to fund them through the existing communications and engagement budget. Is there a seconder for those three? Seconded, thank you. Uh, any discussion on those? If anybody wishes me to separate them into three different ones, I'm happy to do so. Don't see any other hands up for discussion, so I'm then going to call the question. Uh, so the motion, which is those three, is, all, is on the table. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, any other motions arising? Uh, there's another part there that council deferred the decision on the other pieces. We can make that motion as well, so we can. It'll come back uh, for possible. Go ahead, Councilor Green. Is that your motion? Moved. And is there a seconder? Seconded. Thank you. Any other discussion on that deferral for the balance? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed. And opposed. That carries. Uh, any other motions arising at this point? I don't see any. So at this point, I will just thank Ms. Jameson for all the work that she's doing and her team is doing. And uh, it's a big subject to, to cover. I am looking forward to the uh, my turn uh, to do the walkabout next weekend. And I have as well heard very good things about that and, uh, and certainly encourage any of the members of the public that wish to participate to do so uh, yeah, next weekend. You can again register at the connect.oakbay.ca slash infill uh, as the website for, uh, for getting all your information on the infill housing process. Thank you very much, Ms. Jameson. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item section number nine, reports and memorandums. These are subject to public input. So I'm gonna just encourage any members of the public, uh, if you wish to address council on any 9.1, 9.2 or the new 9.3, and I'm just gonna remind you if you're coming in late, uh, we've moved item number 13.1, which was the uh, the First Nations um, notice of motion from Councillor Patterson up to 9.3. Uh, if you wish to address council, any of those is probably worth calling in to the 1855 number. Uh, on the agenda package. And uh, when it's time, uh, if you're listening to this uh, meeting, you can hit star nine to raise your hand to address council on those items. So again, that's the 855 number, uh, hit the meeting number passcode, and then hit star nine at the time when the item comes forward that you're interested in addressing council on. The first two items are likely to go through fairly straightforward. We've, these have already come to committee of the whole and we've had public input on both of these. Um, so we're not anticipating a large, large, large amount of, of consideration. So please do uh, call in or raise your hand if you're in the, um, in the Zoom app at this time uh, using the app itself. So item number 9.1, we have the committee of the whole recommendations from January 17th related to the public art advisory committee report. Um, are there any uh, following questions of council to staff? <clears throat> then I just uh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Oh, thank you very much, Chair, and through you to staff. Um, what is the timeline for um, the implementation of each of these bodies? Just remind me, please. I can't recall that we were we were looking at uh, a specific time frame. Um, I, I will just add that you know the sooner the better, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Um, Ms. Williams, you're probably in the best position to to speak to some timelines on those. Or maybe Ms. Morden is actually. Ms. Morden? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, I have been working with Mr. Meikle on a package to come forward to the March Committee of the Whole Meeting. So we do anticipate that will include the draft terms of reference, uh, revised program guidelines for Arts Laureate for consideration. And Mr. Meikle would give an update on the, <clears throat> excuse me, the community arts volunteer team structure at that time as well. Thank Thanks, you very much. Ms. Morden. Thank you. Uh, for those watching, Ms. Borden is our Deputy Director of Corporate Services uh, and responsible for our committees and commissions. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Appleton and then Councillor Braithwaite. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I was just, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear from Ms. Morden uh, about the upcoming report. And I'm just, there was, uh, the, the discussion at Committee of the Whole definitely uh, spoke in favor of, um, well, I guess I, I heard a general support for the, um, 
uh, community arts council model and of course that has to arise from the community but I'm just um, it, it's so it's different we, we can't obviously mandate anything but I would love to see us sort of collectively signal our support for that in the way that we can and as, as far as a, a principle so I'm just wondering whether staff could speak to uh, well, how we might capture that as far as the upcoming report materials, whether or not we would just make a, a sort of a broad motion, in, including an endorsement for that, or whether or not that um, Arts Council that was discussed at the previous uh, meeting would sort of make an, a, a, an appearance or whether some content to that regard would be included in the upcoming report. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Ms. Morton. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, certainly, I can uh, reconnect with Mr. Meikle and convey that uh, it would be useful to put some updated information into the report. I know that um, they continue to look at that um, at that piece, and so I can certainly convey that. Uh, it might be helpful to have more specific direction from Council if there's something you were looking for specifically to be in that report or that package that's coming forward in March. Uh, thank you. I, th I think, Councillor Afflin, if I may jump in on that one, I think there's, I think clarification of how we could support such a model would be really important so that we actually, you know, if there's if there's aspects of things that we can do to, to facilitate that, uh, things specific to the, the structure of our committees, et cetera, um, that would be, I think, that the important part of that. I would concur, Your Worship. Thank you for that. Yeah, it, it, I, again, because the Community Arts Council model has proven to be successful in other areas, but would imply a degree of support from the district. And I think that what I heard from the discussion at Committee of the Whole was that there was a broad general agreement that that was something that could be supportable at the council table should it be arise from the community. So uh, that consideration of ways, I would concur, consideration of ways that the district could uh, support a community arts council in terms of uh, infrastructure or resourcing. Um, there, there's obviously several models in that regard that we may not have considered. So, Great, thank you for that. Is that satisfactory, Ms. Morton? Yes, thanks, Your Worship. I'm just uh, scribbling notes. I'll be in touch with Mr. Meikle. <laughs> thank, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, thanks, and thanks for bringing that up, uh, Councillor Appleton. That was great. I'm just wondering if I could make the um, the motion, and if you care for the motion now before you go to the public, or would you like to go to the public first? Um, I'm happy to take uh, comments from the public before we move the recommendations that are here. Okay. So um, again, I've already asked for people to hit star nine if you're called into the one eight five five number. If you're within the uh, Zoom app itself, of course, you can go to the bottom of the screen, hit reactions, and hit raise hand. Uh, to speak to council and if none of that is working for you you can uh, always uh, just uh, if you unmute yourself and speak uh, to council at this point uh, to make sure we've captured your attention um, or we've, that we hear your that your request for attention um, again we've had public input on this uh, previously at the committee of the whole but if there's any other additional comments um, we're looking at people wish to make at this point uh, we'll happy to take those and if anybody's, I'm leaving it. I'm leaving it for 30 seconds or so, just because there's sometimes a lag between the uh, the, the live stream. Uh, so I'll do that. And again, call in, hit star six. Um, I, uh, you know, we do. Just if those are wondering, I do allow for public input both times, both at the committee of the whole, where we, we we seek the majority of the public input, but sometimes, you know, if there's ongoing reflection of the recommendations given, uh, further comment desired, then we give the secondary opportunity before we actually move it forward and adopt our own recommendations at the council table. I don't see any hands raised. Um, if I just turn to staff, is there any members of the public that have indicated that they wish to speak that I'm not seeing on my screen? I uh, know your worship, not at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Williams. So with that, uh, go back to you, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thanks. So I'll move that to option B, Community Arts Volunteer Team be recommended to Council as the preferred model for engaging volunteers in public arts and culture programs, and that a combined Parks, Recreation and Culture Committee be recommended to Council as the preferred advisory body structure. I'll second that. Sure. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Uh, any other discussion on these recommendations? Not seeing any, I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? 
and oppose that carries. Thank you very much. Again, if anybody in the public wishes to speak to item number 9.2, uh, which is the checkout bag regulation bylaw, uh, please call in and hit star six at this, or star nine, sorry, to raise your hand at this time. Uh, at this point, we have uh, some recommendations made by Committee of the Whole to Council, but um, I also understand we have a little bit of updated information. Um, Ms. Williams, uh, perhaps you can just, or is it Ms. Morden, perhaps you can just give a, a quick update uh, to us. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Your Worship. It's, it's Sarah Morden here. Um, so in July of 2021, the province issued Ministerial Order Number 309 to amend the spheres of concurrent jurisdiction under the Environment and Wildlife Regulation. So essentially, that ministerial order authorizes municipal councils to, by bylaw, uh, regulate, prohibit, or impose requirements in relation to the environment as specifically set out in that order. Uh, so that would include regulations pertaining to checkout bags. Municipalities must comply with the regulator, the requirements, pardon me, set out in the order. Uh, and in doing so, they no longer have to go through the process of obtaining ministerial approval for those bylaws. So, excuse me, that reduces uh, the time required for the bylaw consideration and adoption process. However, uh, there is a requirement within the order that municipalities set a minimum effective date of at least six months from the date of adoption. Uh, I, Pre presumably to allow businesses time to prepare for that operational change. So um, to the extent that that information may be helpful for your discussion this evening, we just wanted to flag that for you. Thank you very much, Ms. Morton. It's certainly relevant to the, um, just for our awareness about the timelines of, of implementation uh, for that. Now, do we know, uh, for my clarification, is the six months from the moment that we've at the committee of the whole moved it forward with a recommendation or is it adoption of the bylaw and then six months? Uh, thank you. It is adoption of the bylaw, then six months, minimum okay. six months, yeah. And I'll anticipate the question then, um, how quickly do we anticipate that the regulation bylaw will come back to us for, for consideration of, uh, of, of first, second, third reading and adoption? Yes, thank you. So we, we have had an opportunity to sort of map out what that process would look like. Um, at this point, it looks like the earliest recommended adoption date would be uh, sort of late May, early June, which would put us in uh, the latter part of the year for the bylaw actually taking effect. Okay, thank you for that. Probably pretty close to where the federal government is going to be. Um, okay, so with that, we still can have, we have the recommendation that we've given uh, here as Committee of the Whole to move forward with it. Um, so uh, and that's the piece here, um, but take any direction from council. Um, normally we would move this forward uh, with recommendations. Before I go to any recommendations on this though, I will once again, just ask if there's any members of the public that have indicated they wish to speak on this. And uh, again, within the Zoom app, you can raise your hand. Uh, and if you've called into the 1855 number, this is the time to hit star nine uh, to make sure that we're able to see your request. Um, Ms. Williams, I've already made that call a couple of times. Is there anybody who's indicated they wish to speak to us on this item? Thank you, Your Worship. Nobody at this time. Okay. So we'll come back to the council table then and just uh, go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Thank you, Your Worship. So I would be pleased to move the staff recommendations as outlined here in the three components uh, mentioned in the staff report. Second. Second. So this is the recommendations uh, here that the uh, be added to work plans for 2022, um, single use plastics referred back to staff, uh, communications outreach, and then uh, follow up communications to local businesses. Those are the recommendations? Correct, Your Worship. Perfect, thank you, just so we're all clear. Um, I moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion on those? Go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'm, I'm speaking in support of the motion. Uh, I do note in the report that uh, there will most likely be federal regulations in this area that may supersede and, and make uh, make moot some of the actions at the local authority level. I'm sure staff will come back at an appropriate time and either um, uh, defer or cancel some of this uh, these motion uh, uh, motion items moving forward uh, if that is deemed appropriate. Yeah, thank that you, Councilor. Absolutely Absolute. reasonable. That assumption is very reasonable, and that any anything that that especially that, that counteracts the uh, the superseding legislation would have to come back to us. Uh, Councillor Green, yes, thank you. And just briefly, I too will support the motion. Um, I had um, raised the issue earlier, I think, in our discussions about this particular item, um, because I'm the liaison to the 
Business Improvement Association just to ensure that, that they were prepared and ready. But I think this allows a sufficient grace period and a period to adapt. So I'm, I'm very supportive. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Apple, uh, Councillor Green, um, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I also uh, speak in support of the motion. I think this is, uh, it's, it, we have waited a while to, for this to come, but I, I must, I also would like to say that I have noticed that there are many people in this district that are already um, utilizing good practices um, to this end. At the same time, I do notice that at our um, transfer station, that there is a lot of plastic that comes to the transfer station. So if, if we are adopting this um, uh, ban in essence of single use plastics in the district, I think it might be worthwhile also um, considering how that may if it does at all affect what uh, we are intaking at the land at our transfer station, um, or if it if it makes any difference at all. And so I think it would be very good to down the road, perhaps get some feedback from the, um, from the people that operate that station to see if we are noticing any difference on that side of the, uh, the equation. Thank you. And you're speaking to the volume of plastics coming in. Yeah, fair enough. Um, don't see any other discussion on this topic or any other hands, last minute hands popping up on it. So I'll go back to uh, call the question at this point. All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Oh, Cal uh, Councillor Zelka, were you opposed? No, you were speaking in favor. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask whether the public was given an opportunity to speak. Yes, I've given two and a half times now that, that opportunity, so I'll leave it there. Um, and then item number 9.3 for anybody who's just uh, coming in late, uh, we are actually going to be dealing with what was item number 13.1 on the agenda. So if I can just have people move to that portion of the um, agenda. We, this was actually moved and seconded already uh, as it is, uh, and uh, but was deferred because we ran out of time at the former meeting. Um, so it's back in front of us today. I think there's uh, there's two halves of this that we can probably deal with a little bit separately. One is more of an, an uh, informational update to the website and, and pieces, and then the other one is a the contemplation of a task force uh, to uh, to undertake some work. Um, Councillor uh, Patterson, you spoke to this at the last meeting, but it might be worthwhile just to uh, reiterate very briefly your um, your motion and, and what you're trying to accomplish here so that we have a framework for anybody that's tuning in to see this uh, this motion. And again, uh, this is open for public input. If people, members of the public wish to address, this is was item 13.1, item now item 9.3, um, which is related to the um, uh, First Nations Task Force and, and information uh, changes. So if people wish to address council on this item, uh, please, if you uh, call into the one number and hit star nine to raise your hand. Sorry for this long re <laughs> rewording. Uh, or if you're within the uh, Zoom application, you can just use the reactions tab at the bottom of the screen and click the raise hand. So um, that's a long preamble, Councillor Patterson, but uh, over to you now. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, in fact, I did introduce this motion the last time. I do have um, an amended version of this motion that perhaps might um, provide greater clarity and certainty to to in the, the intent of it. Um, and so it, it it does have another it does have another aspect. So um, may I speak to that? You may. Do you have a copy of it written to that we could share I, on the I, screen? I did share. I did share it with the district staff, so they should have a copy of this amendment. Okay. If uh, if I can just ask staff to if you could share that on the screen with us, just so that we're able to read it as well as listen to it, um, that would be very helpful. Ms. Williams, are we able to do that? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I am just going to pull it up and uh, see if I can get it in a format that I can do a screen share on. Okay. I, I would do that, Mayor, but I have to work on two computers when I'm at these meetings, so it makes No, it's fine. But, uh, yeah, we I can't can do a screen share. Copy and, paste, <laughs> copy and paste the language into a Word document yeah. or something. I'm sure that Word document is probably the simplest thing. Yeah. Um, but so why don't you go ahead and, and read, speak to it and or read it out aloud, and then we'll take okay, the uh, I will. It up on screen. 
I will. Um, whereas section 43 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. And whereas the province of BC formally adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples through legislation in November, 2019, therefore be it resolved the council adopt section 43 of the calls to action as a framework for implementing reconciliation and direct staff to publish adoption of and references related to the declaration act and actions towards implementation on the district website and be it further resolved that council instruct district staff to bring forward terms of reference to establish a task force to bring forward recommendations for collaborating and unifying district committees and community associations on building paths to reconciliation with Songhees and Esquimalt nations and in a manner that is respectful to First Nations resource capacity. Thank you, Councillor uh, yeah. Patterson. I'm yeah, just going to give people a check in just to read through it, just so they can kind of give people see it on the screen sufficiently to read it. Can I just get you to zoom in a little bit, Ms. Uh, Ms. Williams, so that the the uh, the text is uh, a little bit bigger? You can probably hit just Control Plus and zoom in. Be all that's required. Oops. If you just go to the therefore be it resolved, I think that's sufficient. And just focus in on that. Oh, but <laughs> there we go. Do we have section forty three? <laughs> handy to have a look at trying to recall what that what is in specifically within that section I can get it. okay well we have this uh, we have this uh, motion so this is you're making a motion to amend uh, the original motion to this I'm just uh, going to contemplate this if it's it's it certainly has the same general tone certainly this and the second part is as, as well within the, the framework but I, I would consider this to be um, within the uh, uh, within the framework of what the original motion was. And so I, I would consider the amendment uh, to be in order um, and certainly would, could be challenged on that, but I'm, I'm, that, that would be my ruling at this point. So thank you for that, Councillor Patterson. Um, and so uh, is there anything else you wish to add at this point then, Councillor Patterson? Yes, thank you, Mayor. And and uh, I thank you for, for accepting that. I wanted to clarify that so that um, there was no confusion as to what it was that I wanted published on the dist district website. Again, I bring this forward um, with humility and acknowledging that the voices of those with lived experience, the Songhees and the Squamalt Nations, are not present to, um, uh, to speak to this. And it was never my intent actually to uh, without that input to rewrite the history on the district's website, but only to to use the same guidance that we are having as council um, to to speak to the whole issue of truth and reconciliation on our district website. So I just I wanted to make that perfectly clear um, in the motion, and I thank I thank um, staff uh, certainly for for assisting with this. And uh, I, just as a brief summary again, the provincial government, of course, passed the Declaration of Rights in 2019. BC Heritage, also in 2019, in response from the membership, produced a standards guide for reconciliation within the heritage sector with the understanding that heritage thrives because of passionate volunteers and they are the driving force between all heritage programs and not the administrators. And in his address to AVICC delegates last year, the Honorable Murray Sinclair recommended that as elected officials, we lead non-Indigenous population to reconciliation, instructing us to do your own learning as a first step. There are actions being undertaken by in many levels um, here in Oak Bay 
Council, of course, has certain responsibilities, uh, and those were pretty well covered in a recent survey from UBCM on the truth and reconcilia reconciliation process that, uh, and any progress that we are making towards it. And, and so that's that's a quite quite a large undertaking if you, you look at the survey of what uh, council members would be considering and what district staff would have to work on. Um, the Certainly the Heritage BC members with our volunteers and the, through the Oak Bay uh, Heritage Foundation um, really lead heritage in this, communi in this community. And they have um, in fact uh, collaborated now with Reconciliation Oak Bay, another um, community-based association that is leading initiatives here. And so there, there's just, and there's actions through the school districts, through University of Victoria. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of actions taking place within the community by a number of groups, but we don't really have a repository for the, the communications. So I see the purpose of this task force that we would point on really working with the, the committees to uh, identify, unify, and recommend on ongoing mechanisms to bring the community and communities longer term together on actions towards reconciliation. I would hope we would have representatives from council with staff support with Oak Bay Heritage and with community um, associations, including Reconciliation and perhaps UVIC. But uh, this is a this is a this is a first step. This is my my intention of this is a first step. The journey will be much longer and will probably um, transition into different um, uh, context as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. I'm just going to before I uh, move forward to other speakers on this. If I make, can we bring back up the motion again on the screen? I think it's uh, this is important. I just looking at the number of, at, at this the first part of this. Um, I see the adoption because this is something that the province is currently working on a framework on how municipalities can and should adopt this framework uh, within their operational pieces. So I think the motion in its intent is in alignment with those those guidelines coming forward. I'm not sure if there's any ramifications though of actually making a formal adoption at a council meeting without consideration of some of the ramifications of that. Uh, specifically, and and I think that was what the province was suggesting that they're they're giving that guidance on. So maybe if I may just go back to staff on this one, and, and to, I'm sort of giving them a little bit of a piece here because this is adoption of an actual policy change as opposed to a um, sort of a guideline for changing a website. So I'm just I want to make sure that we're in good standing here on on that section. I think that might be a little bit outside of our. Of, a, of just an, a change of mo notice of motion that might need to be done a little bit separately, Councillor Patterson. Um, but I might just go to uh, to Ms. Varela on that one. Uh, keep, if you can give us any guidance uh, in terms of that that adopting Section 43, which is the uh, UNDRIP uh, portion of that, uh, is that something? I, I'm I'm feeling like that's probably a little bit outside of the of, a, of an amendment to a motion to change the website. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so ad adoption would be something you might want to consider as a separate item once we have that information from UBCM. If the intention is to get uh, something up on the website uh, with regards to... Sorry, can we just put, if I just interrupt, but can we put the motion on the screen and not the not section 43? Thank you very much for that. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Varela. Yeah, so uh, uh, Your Worship, we may just want to consider the adoption piece uh, as a separate item with, with input from UBCM because they are providing direction on this at the moment. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, Councillor Patterson, I certainly don't want to speak for you, but today you were speaking about just wanting to get those pieces up on the website. Um, so if Council wants to further consider the adoption piece, I'd encourage you to uh, uh, consider that in the work that UBCM is doing, or you could advise staff to go away and see um, what we could do to further explore that piece. I might make a suggestion, Councillor Patrick. I think that is substantially different. If we wanted to adopt in principle Section 43 and 
adopted more formally once those guidelines come out, that might be an appropriate way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I think there'd be lots of support for support for it in principle, subject to the, yeah. that feedback. So would you be willing to make that? Y yes, I would. Okay. Yeah. So can we can we change this uh, this amendment to, to say, um, uh, so is the seconder amenable to that as well? I, I think Councillor Green, you were the seconder on the motion, on the amendment motion. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I would be. And then I, I just wanted to make a comment if I can. Thank Absolutely, you. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's just, so with the move for a second are amenable. So we can just change this to council adopt section 43 of the calls to action. Uh, adopt, I would say adopt in adopt principle. principle. Yeah. If we can say adopt in principle. So that's that's acceptable to the mover and the seconder, and that's great. I think that simplifies our legislative uh, constraints on this a little bit. Uh, anything else, Councillor Patterson, you wanted to add? No, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for okay. that advice. So we're going to deal with this amend this motion as amended because the mover and seconder were, were uh, accepting of that, um, Ms. Williams. So you probably don't have to have the in principle in bold. You can leave it there if you wish. Go ahead, Councillor Green, and then Councillor Nay. Yes, thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge the work that Councillor Patterson has has contributed to this um, this motion. Um, and the interesting part about this this new clause that talks about um, adopting in principle, um, I had intended to bring forward another motion in the future um, in that regard. But uh, in speaking with Councillor Patterson, she and I then agreed to collaborate on the wording at the beginning. The in principle change is, is fine, but I think other communities have, have done similar things. They've adopted this Article 43, which is a very um, important one, and it does acknowledge specifically uh, the importance of municipalities. So I really appreciate um, your patience. I appreciate staff's input, and also I appreciate the work that Councillor Patterson has done. And finally, it um, it enables me to achieve the same goal without having to bring forward another motion, yet another motion. So thank you very much, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Nay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, this is through you, Mayor, to Councillor um, Patterson. I I may have missed the whole point here, but um, when I look at the original uh, the, the original motion that speaks to the the council supporting the TRC uh, calls to action and the declaration as a framework for reconciliation. I, I think that's really important for us to do as a council so that we've got a, um, a legislative kind of framework that we're agreeing to work within. And so I'd like to, I'm not sure, I, I was wondering if Councillor um, Patterson could speak to the omission of that now in this current motion. Because that seems important to me, and maybe you could help me understand your reasoning on it for not. Yeah, that. and go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yeah. Although it was a, it was a whereas comment as opposed to part of the motion, but go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, and 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 thank you, thank you for that question, Councillor Nay. I think that um, with this change to uh, to adopt in principle the forty section forty three of the calls to action as a framework for implementing reconciliation. It does in fact still keep us on the path that we want to um, to be on. And uh, so I, I don't see that it significantly changes from what I had uh, proposed earlier. Um, that, that's my, my I, I think this this just brings greater certainty and allows us something that we can actually publish on the district's website that is concise and has has um, referral materials that people can in fact access through links and 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 do the do do the learning experience that we all need to in fact move forward with uh, uh, with implementation of the calls to action. So um, if I may, Mr. Mayor, just I, I'm going to ask, I see, I see my, um, the way I see it, it wouldn't be omitting that particular part of the motion um, if, if council were to endorse it, but would be to add the whereas to make it a therefore part that we endorse that as a reconciliation framework moving forward. 
to include it as part of this entire motion. It's just a question. I'm just wondering if um, the, the, the mover of the motion would be open to, I don't know if that would be a friendly amendment, Mr. Mayor, but, um, and, and again, I, I'm not seeing it to be included to override that first therefore that's in the current motion. It's an add-on, that's how I see it. So if I may, Councillor Nay, I think I think it's been accomplished already. The whereas clause still exists. It's just not up on the screen here. Oh, um, I, uh, it's yeah. just this is just a therefore be yeah. it resolves, okay. and it actually moves the general support into a more specific adoption of those principles oh, I see. Uh, within the motion itself. So I think I think it actually moves that what you're asking for forward a bit more concretely than mm -hmm. the original motion did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other discussion? I, I, I'm going to uh, probably say. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, go ahead, Councilor Ney. Uh, well, I, and then just to that, to speak to the, the motion I will be supporting, but um, I, I think this is a really, thank you, Councilor um, Patterson, for um, bringing this forward. I, I, I think it's really important and uh, perhaps long overdue as well for us, uh, just to get us all on the same page. And uh, I, I really fully support uh, the idea of a task Force, to get us focused, to get us on the same page, to get us uh, working together with our community and other stakeholders um, and create a, a common understanding about how we're going to work together in a coordinated uh, and, and common kind of uh, foundational understanding about how we as a community are, are going to do this work. So I think that task force, uh, will provide uh, some real value to uh, the district and the community as a whole uh, and our and our First Nations partners. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ney. And I'm just gonna, again, remind the public if they wish to address us, they can do it by hitting the raise hand within the uh, Zoom app or hitting star nine to raise your hand. Uh, if you're calling into the 1855 number, we're getting I think close to the point of, of going to uh, dealing with the motion on the floor. So if you haven't uh, raised your hand and you wish to speak, please do so at this time. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Zelk. I'm just going to remind Councillor Green and A, your hands are still raised on my screen, so maybe we can just have those lowered. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I did want to ask for clarification from uh, the mover and maybe the seconder. I do notice the word committee is used um, uh, frequently in the in the second paragraph. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to, for clarification, what is, does it mean to unify district committees and community associations and, again, committees? Um, I'm wondering whether that second use of committee is possibly a mistake. I would like to ask that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Uh, Councillor Patterson? I thought about this when, um, when I was uh, drafting it. So thank you for the question, Councillor Zelka. The, and the, the use of the word committees is... Uh, is used, in fact, to reference um, a variety of committees that do exist. We do have district committees um, like our Heritage Commission or the Heritage Foundation where members are appointed by council. So they really arise out of the district. There are community associations and there are actually committees that exist within the public realm of the district um, also. And so you know, so it really comes down to are they are they committees that are that are working within the framework of our local government, or are they uh, committees that are, are existing external to the district committees? I just I and I couldn't think of it of another mm -hmm. word to use for those other bodies. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor uh, Patterson. Go ahead, Councillor Zalkin. Let me ask, yeah, thank you. Just a further uh, a clarification request, please. Um, so I'm not sure whether staff ha have any uh, uh, input or, 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 or authority or pull over I, what I presume are external committees, committees external to, uh, to, the, to the district committees. I, I'm, I mean, uh, we, we as a body have, have very little pull and influence, although we have some uh, with community associations and just the committees themselves just seems a little very broad. Um, I, I, uh, would, that, would that also include groups that are outside of the district, such as, for example, the, uh, a group called The Family, it, it, which is um, an external group that's often called on by the uh, Victoria City Council. 
Uh, I don't know who the members are, but uh, but the, for them, for example, they were the ones who recommended bringing down the uh, uh, the uh, McDonald statue. Uh, I, I presume that was, is that a committee that you would want uh, our staff to somehow collaborate and unify with amongst others? The, the, the intent at this point in time, if I may merit through you, uh, the intent at this time was to do outreach to two committees that are, um, are, are, are more contained within the boundaries of our district. Okay. Uh, it could be, could be though, certainly from the university, which is partially in Obey and partially in Saanich. So, uh, but predominantly to start with, I, I, I think the outreach would be much closer within the reach of our, our own di district. That's helpful to know that you're you're intending to stay within the district of Oak Bay. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. I don't see other hands. Uh, Ms. Williams, has anybody from the public indicated they wish to address council? Uh, nobody at this time, Your Worship. Okay, so we'll come back to this table. I'm going to just separate these two because they're sort of distinct uh, directions, and 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 we can have a bit more sort of. Uh, uh, discussion on, on them if anybody wishes to kind of we've had mostly questions at this point um, so I'm going to separate them I'll deal with the first part first which is uh, as, as laid out here adopting principle section 43 of the calls to action are there any other any discussion on uh, the first section at this point I don't see any uh, so I'm, I'll take that as a good sign uh, any uh, I'll ready to call the question then all those in favor and any opposed uh, I seem to have, just want to make sure I can't see, oh, there's Councillor Brithwood. I'm, I'm just going to have to move you on my screen here so I can get you back into this screen. Somehow I've managed to uh, to lose uh, the one uh, visible on there. So there we go. That's better. I can see everybody again. Uh, sorry. Uh, and any opposed? Not opposed. That carries. Thank you very much. And then the second piece, any, any discussion on the second part of this? Go ahead, Councilor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, the, the last portion of this uh, motion that talks about First Nations resource capacity. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Chief Sam has been quoted uh, along the lines, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, uh, about us, not without us, essentially saying that uh, since this specifically makes reference to try to reconcile with Songhees in particular uh, and Esquimalt, of course. Uh, and somehow in terms of, of how we're going to work with them. Uh, so just being uh, uh, respectful of that process, which means we may not be moving fast on this or we may be moving very fast. I'm not, not quite sure. And I appreciate the fact that there's no particular uh, um, a timeline attached to this uh, as, we, as we work our way through this whole process. So uh, I'm, thank you very much for adding that. Thank you. Um... I don't see any other comments. I guess I, I have sort of a general question comment on this one is that, and I appreciate it, I had, I had a chance to speak to Councillor Patterson earlier today to get clarification. And so I think what I understand is to be sort of to develop a point in time understanding of what's out there and how we can work together. Um, and I guess my question is really whether this is better done as a, initially a sort of a committee of the whole where we have people come to that committee and then look at, at the best model, whether it's a task force or other. Uh, or if we resolve that. But it occurs to me actually, as I was, we're having this discussion here today that it, I think if we go about getting the terms of reference done, we could actually determine that in that process. Uh, so we could actually, as we look at the specifics of the task force and how we how we enact it, um, then that would probably be the appropriate place to look at those within the terms of reference. So I, I think, um, I just want to make that comment because I think there is some value to having the, the maximum visibility into this process and then engagement with the community. Um, as possible, but I also appreciate that out of that will probably take some some work to kind of distill some of that down into some recommendations, and that's probably appropriate for a, a smaller working group to tackle. So uh, I'm quite comfortable, I think, with this as it's worded uh, to come back with those with those those terms of reference to help guide us on those next steps. So um, any other discussion on the motion as it's in front of us? Go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess a, a point of um, a, a procedure, or at least a clarification. Uh, in the past, uh, we've had mayor's task force. Uh, this, however, appears to be a council-initiated task force. Um, so I presume it would be called a council task force uh, in, to, to differentiate it. And, and if so, if that is true, um, are there any different types of procedures? Uh, maybe staff could just clarify uh, the different types of task forces that we would be initiating here. Thank you. Sure. A task force is really just a committee, but uh, we'll... Uh, 
Ms. Williams, perhaps you can just confirm or, or clarify any differences here. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, you're correct. Uh, any uh, anybody that's uh, pulled together to to assess a, or inform council or, or recommend to council on a specific topic is a committee, and council has the ability to strike either a select committee or a standing committee. Uh, this would be a select committee of council, and certainly it can be called a task force, and it would would likely have a definitive period of time in, in which to report back to council. And all rules that would apply to any other committee would apply to this one. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, all right, I don't see any other hands up on this item. So um, I'm going to go, I'm sorry, I just have to, my apologies. I have limited this screen uh, real estate on my, uh, on my uh, screen here. So I just have to move things around to make sure that they're actually, I can see what's going on on the screen. Perfect. Councillor Green, you had your hand up. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mayor. And, and just really quickly, I think the advantage of having this task force for me is that we have a focal point that we have now. Um, we have a, a repository, as Councillor Patterson put it, but we also have a coordination of the work, which I think will be really important and easily identifiable for our own community and also for Indigenous communities. So it, it provides a real focus. So um, I, I think it will be a very successful model. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any other hands up, so I'm ready to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed, that carries. Thank you very much. I think that concludes this section, Councillor Patterson. Okay, very good. So uh, going back, that was item number 13, moved up to item number 9.3. Uh, so we're gonna go back into the regular order of business uh, here for the council which would be item number 10. And my apologies, I'm just gonna, I like working off of paper so I can scribble notes as I go. So I'm just gonna pull my paper back in front of me, uh, back to section number 10. Um, we have a series of bylaws and permits. Uh, these are not uh, for public input. We're just, uh, we're considering adoption of, of uh, bylaws that had first three readings. Um, so we have uh, first up item number 10.1. I'll take motions and any discussion that people wish to make. Uh, Councilor Braithwaite moved adoption. Is there a seconder? Seconded, thank you. Any discussion on that? I don't see any, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. Uh, then 10.2, bylaw number 4771, advisory planning commission changes moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, none opposed. And then bylaw number 4772.001, advisory planning commission changes moved and seconded. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that's great to see those actually enacted. And then we have uh, moving on to item number 11, uh, bylaws and permits. These are subject to public input. Um, and so uh, first up 11.1 .1 is the heritage alteration permit uh, for 1561 York Place. Uh, Ms. McDougall, I believe that you are uh, uh, introducing, actually Ms. East may perhaps is introducing the item. Thank you, Ms. Madam. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm here to speak to the item this evening and, and Jacqueline East, who has been working closely on the file, will be here to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the district has received a heritage alteration permit application for 1561 York Place to undertake works to restore the Annandale rock walls along the York and Prospect Place property lines. Um, works have been underway on the subject property since 2017 with the initial building permits uh, were issued and the rock walls had been partially dismantled prior to heritage controls being put in place. Um, a high level summary of key events between 2017 and 2022 are detailed in the staff report and speak to the development of the property uh, and the site's heritage elements. The subject property is on the Community Heritage Register and is also located in the Prospect Place Heritage Conservation Area. HCA policy is included in the official community plan and is supported by guidelines which are used for planning and review of proposed works within the neighborhood. The works included in this application are subject, subject specifically to Section A, uh, the guidelines for heritage resources, and Section D, guidelines for site planning as unprotected property. 
So the scope of the heritage alteration permit application is limited to the undertakings respecting the protected heritage property features and related site works that affect the heritage character of the prospect heritage conservation area. These specifically include the restorative works to the Annandale Rock Walls and the York Place and Prospect Place property lines and, uh, and constructed gates at the wall openings uh, along Prospect Place and more generally uh, impact the site character resulting from the reconstruction. Proposed works include restoring the condition of the rock walls and pillars and constructing new gates for openings. The heritage alteration permit proposal is described through a detailed analysis of section A those heritage resources and, and uh, section D site planning um, guidelines provided that uh, that's in attachment eight of the report. This heritage alteration application uh, was presented at the September 21st uh, 2021 Heritage Commission meeting. Members of the Heritage Commission had questions regarding the size of the existing and proposed openings in the walls, uh, lightings and materials being used for the construction of the gates. The commission subsequently recommended that the proposal for the gates uh, at 1561 York Place be denied. And as such, staff requested additional detail from the applicant about the proposed gates uh, following that meeting. These de uh, details about these uh, ad the additional information can be found in attachment number seven uh, and show the new court and steel gates proposed for the three access points to meet both the uh, national guidelines and our local HCA guidelines which have been designed to be compa compatible with the new house and to complement the area's heritage elements. According to the Luxton memo, uh, attachment number four, this approach is consistent with the standard and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada for rehabil rehabilitation interventions, specifically that any new work should be physically and visually compatible with, subordinate to, and distinguishable from the historic place itself. With regards to the rock walls, the proposed works would finish the openings using compat compatible de design and materials. Um, so along Prospect Place, the rock walls uh, consists of rubble granite construction with simple gray tooled rope molding and has historically consisted of a single pedestrian access opening framed by two pillars with a single panel ornamental wrought iron gate. Proposed works to this rock wall includes rebuilding and repointing the wall with rebuilt gate posts on each side of the pedestrian and vehicular openings. And then the York Place rock wall is part of the original granite wall uh, of the Annandale property. Uh, this wall historically included a driveway opening with two uh, tall stone pillars and an Art Nouveau iron gate. The salvaged Annandale gate post capstones will be reinstated and the restorative works will be completed using the reclaimed granite rocks and concrete pillar caps that were previously deconstructed. Detailing for all gate posts will include concealed wiring uh, and for the intercon system uh, with mortaring and pointing techniques uh, consistent uh, for each wall uh, as they're a little bit different from each other. So the, the details will be designed to be uh, sympathetic to the details of each uh, the rock, uh, the, York, the York Place and the Prospect rock walls. Overall, the proposed restorative works would improve the rock walls uh, from their current state where the walls were previously modified to accommodate uh, construction activity on the property. The heritage alteration permit would enable the owner to reconstruct the walk walls and construct new gates for the openings. Without the issuance of a heritage alteration permit, the work cannot be done. The applicant proposes to use materials and techniques keeping with the prospect heritage conservation area guidelines and the character defining elements of the Annandale rock walls. Um, see attachment three for more details and staff consider the application to be supportable uh, and ready for council's consideration. A number of options are presented in the staff report for council's consideration this evening. And uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, Jacqueline East, who has worked closely on the file, is here to answer any questions that you might have as she has worked very closely on the file. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. McDougall, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. East, for being here this evening. Um, before I move to questions, uh, Ms. East, is there anything you wish to add to uh, Ms. McDougall's presentation? Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I think Caitlin did a, um, a great job uh, summarizing the application, so I'm happy to take questions. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, and again, this is uh, available for both the public input, and we I understand we do have the applicant uh, with us as well. 
Uh, so they may also wish to answer some of the questions uh, of council. Um, so I'm going to go to questions from council uh, to either staff or the applicant. Then we'll go to questions or uh, comments from the public, and then we'll come back to this table for uh, discussion as we move it forward. So if you're a member of the public and you wish to address council, um, you can raise your hand at any time, but certainly if you're on the app, you can do it uh, at the time I make the call. Uh, if you're calling in the 855 number that's on the agenda package, um, you can call in and hit star nine to raise your hand, and I will call out your phone number at the time uh, to get your input. We have received a number of pieces of correspondence uh, as noted in the agenda, both the original time of uh, November 8th and more recently for this meeting. So if those uh, items have already been provided by uh, by written, you don't need to uh, reread them or, or, or cover those, but you're welcome to speak to us and just draw attention to highlights as well, of course. So with that, I'm gonna go to members of council for questions. Uh, I will just go in the order you're showing up on my screen. Uh, so that's Councillor Green, Braithwaite and Appleton. Thank you very, uh, very much, Mayor. Through you, um, and just a question to um, Ms. McDougall and Ms. East, if she's available. Um, I just wondered, and I'm out of touch now with the Heritage Commission. It's been some years since I've, I've been directly involved, but, and, and perhaps Andrew Appleton, um, Councillor Appleton can help us with this as well. But um, I understand this item did go to the Heritage Commission. Um, could you briefly tell me uh, what their input was on, on, this, on this item? at the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Green. Ms. East, perhaps you can just summarize their recommendation. Um, absolutely. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, their recommendation that I have, I was not at the meeting myself, um, but they, they, they recommended a denial of the application and their reason was because they, um, they thought the, the width of the opening were too wide and uh, they also were concerned about the design of the new gates. Thank you, Ms. East. Councillor Green, anything else? Thank you very much. No, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Councillor Braithwaite and Councillor Appleton. Thanks very much. Um, from your report, um, Mr. Gloom, Ms. East, um, I noticed that you do say that the owner can't, can't reconstruct the walls without the HCA, but then it also says the existing condition broken wall no gates however can remain indefinitely without the issuance of a permit so does that mean that he um the applicant could leave that in place forever and ever and ever without ever having to fix that wall yes, thank, you. thank you for the question through your worship councillor braithwaite uh, yes that is correct there is nothing to compel the property owner to build those walls. He, the property owner simply needs the uh, heritage alteration permit in order to build the walls the way that he desires to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, it says that um, it all, in your report, it also says the applicant proposes the new gates to be compatible with the new house and complementary to the heritage elements. And I'm, I'm wondering if, um, I mean, the original gates that were there were obviously complementary to the house that was there. Um, and do we know where those original gates are or um, if we're able to um, get those original gates back? Sure. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss East, you can answer if you can, otherwise I can go to the applicant if they uh, wish to answer. Thank you, Your Worship. I think that I don't have that answer. I think that would be a question for the applicant. Sure. Uh, thank you. And then, so uh, we have a number of people here uh, uh, representing the applicant, everything from the owner and uh, an architect and uh, and Mr. Alexander, I believe, is here as well. So I'm not sure who on the um, on the applicant's team wishes to just answer the question about whether or not the original gates are uh, still available for, for reuse. You can just speak up. I can't right. see Sorry. everybody. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Mr. Right. Miller, welcome to the meeting. Sorry, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, the iron gate that was uh, on the prospect, sorry, on the York Street frontage is no longer available. Um, and it was uh, under width, approximately eight foot six, nine feet. And then the uh, gate that was previously on the south end, sorry, the north end of Prospect, which was approximately uh, six feet, is also no longer available. So it's been a number of years and um, they had been, uh, in one case, uh, donated, uh, in one example, donated just because it was uh, deteriorating, they used um, for an for a ornamental uh, item in a heritage house. 
Thank you, Mr. Miller. Back Thank you. I, I, I seem to remember um, in 2018 at the meeting, I asked about the gates and I, I believe that you said that um, if you had to get those gates back, you could, but apparently that's not the case anymore. So. Um, that's unfortunate. Actually, um, just for, for clarification, Kelsey Braithwaite, uh, Mr. Miller, it's four years on. Just is that is maybe you can just answer the question. I coincidentally, that question was asked, and I actually did go to the person's house and retrieve the gates. As a matter of fact, um, at the time, there this property was under consideration for redevelopment, and uh, I did actually go and get it and store it until such time as it was uh, uh, evident that it was no longer going to be a redevelopment. It was going to be used as existing uh, single family use. And at the time, uh, prior to the uh, heritage conservation adoption, I didn't have a use for the gate. So I redonated them back at that time. So it's been a number of years. So your question is, is spot on. And I did actually get them and store them and then in turn, pass them back on again. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Keep going, please. Thank you. Um, so all um, there was one letter that we received from, um, I believe it was Barb Grant, and this would be a question to staff. Um, in the um, letter, and it was dated February 13th, um, it, she says that, uh, that she wishes to draw our attention to some mistakes and inconsistencies in the new February 14th report. And it talks about um, this concrete pillar caps. Um, it says the original, the report refers to the original granite capstones as concrete pillar caps that were previously deconstructed. Um, and it's suggesting that perhaps um, we need to have that changed back to uh, substitute granite for concrete. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, Ms. East, I believe that is correct. That was just the, the wording would have to be, the original caps is the important part, but they were the original granite caps, is that correct? Um, through your worship, yes, that, that the original intent was that it would be the um, original granite caps. So I think that would be another, clear. if there was further clarification required, I would have to turn again to the, um, uh, perhaps the architect or the applicant. But that, sure. my understanding was that they would be replaced with the granite and apologies for any confusion that we had language inconsistent. No, no worries, Ms. East. I, this has gone through a couple of things. Um, perhaps I'll just go to the, the team. I, I understand that that's the intent of the original granite caps uh, to be replaced. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Miller or member of team? I can certainly answer that. It's Donald Luxton. Um, the, um, uh, it, it would be the original granite uh, caps, absolutely. Great. Yeah, and it's in, it's indicated so on the drawings. It is. I think it's just it's just yeah. We had a, a carryover from an earlier misstatement, and it's continuing to this this uh, this report. So thank you for that, Mr. Lux. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Anything further? I'll let some, someone else go before I ask my other questions. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Appleton. Thank you, Your Worship, um, and through you, I think this is probably a question potentially for um, the 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 applicant team. And maybe specifically Mr. Luxon, but um, I do uh, appreciate Ms. East's comments about uh, about the discussion that did occur at the Heritage Commission. Um, and as liaison, of course, I was I was party to that discussion, and I did hear loud and clear from the members of the commission uh, concerns about the size of the openings in the walls, and particularly about the materials used for the gates. The materials and the design of the gates um, was definitely a significant thing. So, I'm I'm struggling a little bit with some of the language that's used in the in the HCA guidelines as compared to some of the information that's provided as far as standards for the gate materials um, and the design of the gates. Um, so as Councillor Braithwaite noted, um, you know, the, the, the report and the materials does indicate that the design is, is to complement the area's heritage elements through selection of materials. Um, and um, so I'm struggling a little bit with this complementary and subordinate to type of language. Um, so clearly the, the types of materials and the design of gates um, in the prospect uh, take a, from my observation, a different form from this. Um, and the HCA guidelines specifically speak, they speak directly to the layout of Prospect Place and the streetscape of Prospect Place in that the, the uh, street level uh, experience and, and what you encounter at street level is significant. 
to the heritage conservation area. So, um, but in the materials provided by the applicant, there's it's fairly um, it's it's mentioned in a couple of cases that the design and the materials used in in the gates proposed um, are as as stated complementary and subordinate to, um, and that was not. I, I think what I heard uh, most of the members of the Heritage Commission state. So I'm just wondering whether they, some further information could be provided um, from a heritage perspective, how specifically the gates that are proposed um, fit in with the design of the neighborhood and, and meet those uh, prospect HCA guidelines. Sure, thank you, Councillor Appleton. Um, and Ms. Issa, I'll let you address that first and, I'll, and then I'll allow Mr. Luxton, I think it was also, it should be offered the opportunity to, to articulate the rationale. Um, I think it's also important to note and perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. East, that uh, the determination of that uh, appropriateness is ultimately the, the, the responsibility of this body in, in, in approving and not approving the, 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 uh, the heritage alteration permit. So I think that is ultimately, your, your question goes right to the core of our decision making here tonight, Councillor Appleton, is do they meet the guidelines in that, in that stance? So uh, Ms. East, perhaps you can uh, provide a, a summary of, 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 of that piece in terms of the, uh, the heritage guidelines. And then I'll go to Mr. Luxton to, to add in there as well. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, I'll I'll just do a, a quick summary of of where we how we where we landed on in terms of the design of the gates because we did it is the crux of the matter and it's absolutely council's uh, de determination of whether or not um, the gates as as uh, as proposed to be designed do fit these guidelines uh, from a. Um, a planning perspective for this report, we did rely upon um, Mr. Luxton, who, who will speak further to this, but we looked at the guidelines themselves and we looked at the, um, briefly through uh, Mr. Luxton's lens, the national guidelines and thought about the materials and the subordinate nature of the gate. The materials uh, presented, uh, we did ask for more details from Mr. Miller um, and he did provide, um, the, Mr. Simsic, uh, did the architect, did provide more information about this gate because it wasn't clear to us um, in afterthought um, um, the material that was presented to the Heritage Commission about what these gates gates were really made of. So we began to understand what the, that the quartz and steel, uh, which is a weathered steel, and then is the iron mongery that is spoken of in some of the re submitted reports. And we did get a sample delivered to the uh, district office so that we could see exactly what that was in terms of a natural material. So we were confident that the material was a natural and listed material in the guidelines. And then we also um, understood the detail that half the gate, um, the design of the gate is actually cutouts. And that would be um, uh, that it, that is a, a design, an application of a design treatment that is, is although it's modern, it would, it would uh, lend itself to the idea of, of that um, the original um, historical or heritage um, iron, wrought iron gates. So we did find ourselves in a position to see that it did meet the intent of the guidelines. And I think for the, any further sort of design, con uh, um, I, I would prefer to hear that from directly from Mr. Luxton or from a design perspective, Mr. Simsek, but we were um, certainly uh, confident in, in landing there as a consideration for council, but certainly that's council's um, decision. Thank you very much for that, Ms. East. Uh, I will go to you now, Mr. Luxton, uh, and uh, welcome back to the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. And through the chair to uh, uh, Councillor Appleton's question. Uh, we looked at this uh, directly and that was in uh, submitted in a memo by myself on September 9th of last year. And uh, our approach to this has been consistent since the very beginning. Um, the conservation of the both rock walls on Prospect and York, um, if we look at the overall conservation, the walls are being kept, restored, cleaned up, repointed, um, we are doing exactly in this application what the HCA would request in terms of conservation of a historic feature. The, the challenge, and this is where I think the discussion has not been necessarily 
as focused as it could be is the fact that there are rehabilitation interventions to the wall, which we commonly do when we conserve historic features for functional reasons. So if you think of any re uh, rehabilitation of a house where you might add a, an extra door or something to make the house function differently for current usage, that's exactly what's being proposed. But overall, 95% of these walls are being completely conserved. So the issue really comes around the rehabilitation of the openings and the, the gate design. Um, in terms of meeting the um, Heritage Conservation Area guidelines, because there really are two sets of guidelines here and they're complementary. In terms of meeting the intent of the Heritage Conservation Area guidelines, we are conserving the rock walls and we are not using inappropriate materials such as aluminum, which are not um, uh, not recommended within the area. So there's a very conscious desire, and I can certainly turn it over to Mr. Simsek to answer the design questions, but to answer the heritage questions, we would not um, generally recommend mimicking a, a, an historic feature if it's going to be changed or inappropriately designed. So for example, even if we could reuse the original gates, the openings need to be expanded and the gates won't fit. So whatever you put in there would be some kind of redesign of the original, which is really not recommended in the national standards and guidelines. So there is a lot of language in those guidelines that allow us to adapt for modern usage and still remain as standard 11 says, compatible, sympathetic, and uh, subordinate. So subordinate means trying not to draw attention to yourself. And it's been my agreement on this application that the materials being proposed will patina, will weather, will settle in nicely and actually look appropriate over time, which is a very important part of, of standard 11. So in in conclusion, I just I would just point to my memo of September 9th and say that we had considered all of these points, that we feel this is an extremely appropriate um, rehabilitation of a historic feature. Uh, the rehabilitation is a very minor part of the conservation of the feature, and therefore we feel this is a, a very much an approach that meets both sets of guidelines. Uh, thanks, uh, Don. I, I'll just add a few comments regarding design and sort of our office's thinking about this uh, with respect to design. It's sort of an interesting challenge in a way, I guess, because we're clearly, we've clearly designed a very contemporary house that's being constructed on the property and we're surrounded by a very beautiful and historic landscape full of a lot of Gary Oak trees and of course the perimeter lined with the heritage rock wall which is also very beautiful so uh, you know our approach I guess uh, a few of our sort of lines of thinking was number one to keep the gate very delicate you know as delicate as we can so it's approximately half inch thick um, cut out with it's quite highly cut so it forms almost a kind of lacy transparent um, kind of appearance for most of it um, so it's intended to be really light and delicate in contrast to um, the heaviness of and solidity of the stone wall and in that respect does i guess relate back to the heritage gates which are typically um, dark in color and quite thin in the in the members that uh, are being used for the construction. So we definitely picked up on both. I mean, the, the core 10 um, ages and patinas and becomes quite dark, like a dark brown color. It's probably as natural a material as you can build a gate with in the sense that, um, you know, short of like solid wood or something, it's but in terms of something that's very durable, long-lived, it, it um, 
actually connects quite well to a lot of the veining that's in the rocks in the walls. There's a lot of iron veining throughout. There's also a lot of red in the in the mortar uh, pointing um, in the bead finish between the rocks along York. So I think there was a definitely a desire to be uh, fairly subtle in the surface of the material. It's quite dark, quite matte, um, appears to be quite natural. It's a very raw um, feeling material. Um, yeah, and again, the tones dark and the color, um, sorry, and the weight of it, sort of keeping it very thin, you know, gates of that scale are often quite bulky. They have a very thick perimeter tubular steel frame. You look at most modern gates that function in a contemporary way where they're, you know, operated by mechanical means. Um, they generally have a lot of what I'd call apparatus and they, you know, they, they don't um, feel delicate. They feel quite mechanistic. And so we did a lot in the design to conceal any of the sort of um, mechanisms associated with the gate and really present it more monolithically as this um, core 10 iron um, material. Thank you for that. So can I just, give, for our clarification, the core 10 is a sort of rust colored, more solid panels, is that correct? And there'd be a, a, a more of a dark steel for the lattice portions, is that accurate? It's one, it's cut out of one singular sheet of core 10. Oh, okay, so it's the same material all the way across. It's, it's one material all the way across, that's all you see. So it's very monolithic and yet obviously much of it is cut away so that you get this a bit of transparency and a more of a delicate um, feel to the material. Thank you for that. And just for our clarification, um, could you give us the height of each of these gates? Because I think we were originally looking at the originals, they were all, they were fairly tall. I'm, I get the sense these are not quite as tall. Um, do I have that? I'm just looking at the, from the, from the design here, they look like they're about four or four and a half feet. Uh, I believe what I'm looking at. Four. It's hard to tell for sure. I'll just have to pull up a drawing. Sorry. No, uh, no problem. I believe they are four. Yes, four feet tall. Correct. And that's true for all of the gates? Yes. Okay. Yes. So in fact, okay. So they'll look over gates, not look through for the most part. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Just as a side note on that, um, because there is a swimming pool on site, we also had to ensure the gates were um, provided um, safety and security um, because of the swimming pool and the related bylaws. So you can't have large openings that, you know, that a, a kid could sort of squeeze through and come onto the property. It had to be of a certain height, again, to prevent easy access. So that's that's really in keeping with following the the, the bylaw that uh, pertains to swimming pools within residential properties. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry, and I have, uh, I think Councillor Appleton, you still had the floor. Did you wish to add anything else? Any other questions? No, thank you, Worship. I'll uh, yield the floor to my colleagues. Okay, thank you very much. I have Councillor uh, Green and then Patterson. Oh, sorry, I had Green already, so I'll go to Councillor Patterson and then back to Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And uh, a question, um, I don't know who's best suited to answer this, so I will leave that to uh, you and the applicants. But we were provided certainly within the framework of the HCA, historic gatescapes, and there's, um, you know, a wonderful picture array of the historic gates that um, exist within the, the, the district. Most of the um, illustrated gates are, of course, um, the, the heritage gates themselves. They are manually operated gates. Um, and I, I don't see within the context of any of the information where there was, um, where there was thought presented as to a more modernized approach to the gates um, since we don't have many gatekeepers 
standing by the ready to open large gates anymore. They are mostly all on automated systems as, as these are proposed. Um, and so how would, you know, I'm wondering if somebody can speak to, to, to what might be required by way of having automated opening gates uh, as compared to some of the wrought iron gates that are shown as examples of, of what we aspire to have uh, within the HCA. Sure, I think I'll give that to Mr. Luxton just because I think it does tie to the heritage, specific aspects of the heritage alteration, uh, heritage conservation area. Uh, Mr. Luxton, perhaps you can, you can address Councillor Patterson's question. Uh, Thank you. Through the chair to Councillor Patterson, um, uh, it does indeed mark a change. And so, um, again, within the standards and guidelines, the, uh, the, the national standards, which is where we go to for our guidance about how to manage heritage values and heritage objects, the, the key issue is that we do have to accommodate change. So for example, we have to accommodate accessibility within our um, heritage buildings. So we sometimes have to install ramps or alternate means of access. And those are just a recognition of change in use, technology requirements, um, that we, we accept the fact that there will be management of change of these, of these heritage places. So in the same way, since we don't have horse drawn carriages and whatever they had when the property was first built, we were recognizing that there is, we need some modern intervention here. And it is clearly an intervention and it is clearly distinguishable from the historic situation. So it is no different than finding that we need to redo you know, our kitchen in an, our heritage home because we don't want to cook with wood anymore, or certain things like that. So it is a recognition of change. There is no question about that, that this is a contemporary intervention and is therefore designed as such. And one of the things I'll point to in, in the national standards and guidelines is basically they're also asking you not to fake anything. You're, they're saying if, mm -hmm. if you are putting in a contemporary intervention, it should be distinguishable. You should be able to see that it is not the historic condition. So we often do that in our conservation projects. We have to change things. We have to seismically upgrade. We have to make things accessible. We have to put in new plumbing and wiring. We have to put in new uses sometimes. In this case, the change is, as I mentioned, quite minor in terms of the overall conservation of the, of the, of the walls. The walls are there. They will be restored. 95% of it will be exactly as it was. Mm. So this is a change that recognizes new technology, new needs for access, new needs to keep kids out, new needs, et cetera, that are, that are bylaw driven as well. Thank you, no further questions, Mayor. You're muted, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Patterson, over to you, Councillor Green. That would explain the lack of response from Councillor Green. <laughs> Actually, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think um, I think Mr. Luxton has really answered the question I had. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just note we have, I see sort of uh, four questions that we sort of need to make sure that we're, we're addressing here. And um, so this is sort of, uh, do we want to restore those walls? Uh, what are the appropriate crossing widths? are the gates in, in keeping with the guidelines and I, I'm not sure if my only question I have here for the applicants is the original application that's still in the report speaks to uh, powder coated aluminum for some of the signage and I just want to make sure that we're clear that, that seems like that was being removed and I just want to make sure that the materials chosen for the for the external signage in terms of the numbers uh, is being uh, materials in keeping with the um, HCA. Mr. Miller? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That was a request uh, by staff recently to modify the application from powder-coated aluminum to steel. 
uh, numbers, which we complied with. Uh, okay. I believe it was updated in all the drawings. Um, and there seems to be a miscommunication around aluminum or steel. So we tried really hard and staff worked very diligently on clarifying that uh, the entire up the entire uh, intervention on this particular uh, use is all in steel, no, no matter where it's being used, which of course will allow patina over time, much like the like the Corten gates. I said, thank you very much for that clarification. I, I saw it on just one of the drawings still, I think it was still left in there. So uh, that's why, I, thank you for that clarification. That was my understanding. I just wanted to make sure that we were, so we, we don't in fact need to deal with that at all tonight. That's already been addressed. So thank you for that. Um, I don't see other hands in terms of questions. So I'm happy to go out uh, to any members of the public that wish to, uh, to speak to council uh, or raise questions that I can perhaps put forward to staff or to the applicant. Um, at this point, uh, I will again call if you're watching the live stream, uh, please call the one eight five five number. Hopefully you've done that already. Uh, enter the meeting ID and passcode uh, that are in there. Um, this is the meeting ID ending in 0600 and hit star nine to raise your hand. Uh, and if you're attending us uh, with the Zoom meeting itself, you can go to the bottom of the screen hit the reactions button and click the big raise hand button there. Uh, and that should uh, raise your hand on my screen in front of me uh, and certainly in front of staff to, uh, to a flag that you wish to address council on this item. So I'm gonna, just because there is a bit of a time delay uh, between when the, um, uh, when I say that and sometimes when I guess out through YouTube for people watching the video live stream up to 45 minutes, seconds or a minute, I'm just going to give a minute for people to uh, to have that opportunity to call in uh, and raise your hand. Again, if you call in using the meeting ID and passcode, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and I will call on you by your uh, last four digits of your phone number uh, should you wish to address council. Uh, I'm going to leave that option open as well for a few minutes uh, just as we get into consideration and deliberation. Uh, should anybody wish to uh, to speak to us, just understanding that sometimes it can take a minute or two to uh, to go through the system and uh, and get in front of us. I don't see anybody within the app that has indicated they wish to speak to the item on the agenda. So I'm going to go back to staff and just ask staff if there's anybody uh, who's dialed in that has indicated they wish to speak to uh, this matter on the agenda. Thank you, Your Worship. There's nobody at this time. Okay, uh, someone who has, uh, I just noticed, popped their hand up at this point. Uh, so I'm going to invite them to join the meeting. If you hit star six to unmute, your last four digits are 3247. That's 3247. If you hit star six, you should unmute and be able to address council. There you are, you are unmuted. Welcome to the meeting. If you could just state your name and municipality of residence, uh, and then uh, feel free to address council. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. The system works. Great. Good. My name is Barb Grant. I live in the Prospect HCA. As a former member of the HCA working group, I'd like to address a statement made in the staff planning report, page 32, in the assessment tool created by staff. Quote, Annandale Rock Walls Restoration proposed with modern contemporary gates to avoid new pseudo-historic features or embellishments, unquote. The phrase new pseudo-historic pseudo features or embellishments has been taken from the guidelines out of context, been reinterpreted, and is now somewhat misleading. The guidelines do not endorse the introduction of modern gate design. The mention of pseudo-historic features and embellishments comes on page 17 of the guidelines under guidelines for architectural details. Recommended are, quote, repairs and or reinstatement of architectural detailing that is consistent with the date of construction of the heritage resource and is based on documentary or physical evidence. Not recommended is the introduction of new pseudo-historic features or embellishments where there is no evidence of their previous use on the building, unquote. In other words, for example, we're not to be putting Victorian style embellishments on a mid-century bungalow. The stated intent of this section also includes this, quote, where physical evidence for original detailing is not present, research into original plans, historic photographs, 
and other supporting evidence may support reinstatement or new design unquote in conclusion the guidelines do not endorse the introduction of modern gate design instead they recommend that quote complementary new design will be sympathetic to the traditional architectural character of the area unquote page 27 and quote limiting the potential negative impacts of new development on adjacent protected properties is critical to the successful integration of new buildings within the prospect HCA unquote section C guidelines for new construction page 26 you know when I think I think about this situation this issue I just don't see why we can't find a compromise design that meets the needs of both the HCA and the applicant. I hope this brings a bit more clarity to this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Grant, for calling in and uh, addressing council uh, so clearly. And, uh, and thank you again for your service on the uh, Heritage Conservation Area Working Group um, to help develop those guidelines. Um, are there any other members of any other uh, members of the public that have indicated they wish to speak? Um, I'll go to uh, Ms. Williams at this point just to see. Uh, no, your worship, nobody else at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we're back to this uh, to this table. Uh, certainly willing to take any additional questions, and uh, or uh, motions are also appropriate at this point. Um, again, we are tasked with either sort of three things: uh, approval, uh, referral, or uh, or decline. Um, although the decline or the referral could uh, have some nuance attached, and certainly anything that involved a decline should should definitely provide as clear as possible direction uh, so that the applicant is very clear about what would find success uh, within a heritage alteration permit. I see Councillor Braithwaite and Councillor Ney, um, so I'll go in that order. Go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Thanks. I just um, wanted to go um, uh, and talk a little bit again about the um, the uh, materials that are being used for the gates. Uh, I know that in the staff report on page 33, it talks under A4, under building materials, so that we need to continue the legacy of high quality traditional materials. And then it talks about using uh, steel instead of iron. And I just, I, 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 I struggle, this is where I'm really struggling quite a bit is between the iron uh, gates that were there before and the proposed steel gates that are coming in. And, and, and maybe um, someone, um, maybe the architect could chat with me a little bit about um, why why the difference between why why would you go with with steel rather than iron when steel is what was first there and what would maybe perhaps would have made the the, the residents around there a little bit happier thank you councillor Braithwaite uh, I'm happy to go to uh, the architect uh, do you have a piece of the material there to show I think somebody does in this call uh, to kind of uh, showcase it uh, if not maybe our staff do but uh, go ahead Mr. Simsek sure um, you know I'm not an expert in metallurgy but the bit that I know is um, you know iron is is an element um, you know there's iron in the stone on the wall. Iron on its own has really very little strength, so it is always alloyed combined with other elements to create, for example, steel. Um, so even wrought iron is technically not just iron. It has carbon in it that allows it to have certain strength qualities, physical properties. Um, it's not something that's really used anymore as a material. Um, so I, I imagine maybe that's what was meant by iron is, uh, is a wrought iron. Um, there's a lot of sort of, uh, let's say, um, inauthentic versions of wrought iron that um, require uh, painting or finishing um, a constant kind of upkeep. And 
you're basically covering the raw material with with a paint, which is ultimately what you see is the paint. So our desire was actually to remain entirely natural in the sense that the material itself is breathing and engaging with the environment and and is subject to the forces of nature and it has the durability and capacity to uh, withstand that and to remain durable for many many decades really so um, yeah I don't know if that entirely answers the question but that's um, basically my understanding. Thank you, Mr. Simsek. Uh, Ms. East, did you just put up a picture of the metal as, as your as yes, your uh, avatar? Yes, your your worship. I I have uh, I, I I did see the actual um, product in person in the district office, so I can can confirm this is what it looks like. It is uh, a weathered um, steel um, product that continues to weather, as uh, Mr. Simsek uh, you uh, explained earlier. Thank you very much for that. Councilor Braithwaite, was there additional questions? I just want to point out, um, Mr. Prince has indicated he wished to speak. He can't uh, raise his hand within the app, so I might invite him to unmute in a second, but I'll, I'll finish with you first, Councilor Braithwaite, then I'll go. You're done? So, Mr. Prince, I know you're on the app right now. If you if you wish to just unmute yourself, um, usually there's a, a mechanism there at the at, in the top or the bottom, depending on which device you're on. Uh, you've unmuted yourself. You can uh, just state your name and municipality of residence, and then uh, you feel free to address council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I assume you can hear me all? We can hear you well. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Mayor. I had some technical difficulties, but uh, glad to be on. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Prince, uh, resident of Oak Bay. Uh, I live on Prospect Place uh, within the Prospect Heritage Conservation Area. Um, Yeah, I just want to first of all, I guess, uh, remind council uh, if they need to be reminded that the, the gate posts and the gates that we are discussing tonight were identified as character defining elements uh, for the statement of significance that was developed for Annandale uh, a number of years ago. So, uh, uh, although with respect, Mr. Luxton refers to the 95% of the heritage restoration and rehabilitation is about the walls. I want to talk about 100% of the gates. And when we think about the gates, um, uh, the changes are significant. Um, I don't think anyone is really arguing. I don't think any of my neighbors in the prospect are arguing for uh, pseudo history or to kind of mimic or echo exactly what was there. I don't think that's the question. The question is what's before you tonight is that sufficiently in keeping with the character defining elements. And I appreciated it, uh, Councillor Appleton's uh, remarks about the importance of the streetscape um, and the views. The gates are very much part of the public face of this property. Uh, the swimming pool is not and should not be. That's part of a private property and private use and should be quite secure. But these gates on these historic walls are part of the perimeter of this very historic property and they are very much the public face that people will see every day as they stroll by. And so the question is whether the materials, the size and the design really are sufficient to be compatible or sympathetic to the character defining elements. Um, we need the gates because the walls are there <laughs> and the walls are 120 years old and they're being restored as they should be. This isn't any kind of Thank you very much for doing that. This is really about reparations and rehabilitation of much damaged and ignored walls. The gates go with the, the walls and I'm pleased to see that the walls will be restored to what they were and perhaps will be improved. And that's the beauty of rehabilitation and heritage conservation. Um, I do not think with respect to what the staff has said, and I appreciate that some of the tests have been met um, about the, uh, with respect to the national guidelines, that there's been an effort to, to use materials that are in keeping, that are natural. They're in keeping with the guidelines of the HCA and the national standards. But I do not find the additional information that's been provided since the November meeting of the Heritage Commission sufficient to meet the tests that the design is compatible. The gates are not a new piece of work. The gates are a restoration project 
of remediation of replacing gates that were taken away either by design or neglect or by, for other reasons. That's not important. But this is not a tabula rasa. This is not a blank slate of building new gates for a new wall. This is in reinserting gates we're missing into a 120 year plus set of historic heritage walls. Therefore, it's not about adding like an addition to an old McClure house or an old Ratbury house, where of course the addition ought to be subsidiary and distinguishable and separate from the old building. This is about putting in gates that should be compatible and congruent and sympathetic to the 120 year old walls along the streetscapes of these old neighborhoods. That's the question before you tonight, Council. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Prince, and uh, I'm glad we were able to sort out the, uh, the access piece for you uh, through the app. Um, so back here, I have uh, next up, Councillor Nay. Go ahead, Councillor Nay. Um, I, I guess I just have a question with uh, uh, Mr. Prince, Dr. Prince. Um, was he talking about the gate posts or the gate? I'm, I wasn't sure that there was a- he was, speaking, he was speaking to the gates themselves. Ah, okay, okay. Um, well then, um, I, Mr. Mayor, I, I'll put the motion forward to get us uh, moving through this. I think we've heard all the pieces. So I'll move that um, uh, the the staff recommendation as, as per the report. So let's just deal with these one at a time. Let's just do the motion to receive first because that's the procedural okay. piece. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any discussion on the receipt? All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Uh, and then you want to move the second recommendation? Yeah. Uh, read it out or? Um, no, I think it's fairly clear. It's basically to approve the, uh, the application and provide a written record to the property owners. Um, is there a seconder for that motion? I don't see a seconder, so. Oh, Councillor Patterson? I'll second it for discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nay, you have the floor as the mover. Do you wish to speak to the uh, to the motion? Well, um, I, you know, I, 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 I've gone through the report here, all the letters, listened to um, the, the, the applicant's team and uh, to, to speak to the issues. I, the way I see it, the, the issues are that the uh, the walls are being restored and whether the gates are in keeping with the guidelines. And, um, it, you know, I, 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 for me, it really comes down to having listened to the applicant's team, of, a professional team of experts and the neighbors, is there is some degree of subjectivity in the interpretation of these guidelines. Um, so I, I have to say that uh, a particular in um, the information provided by Mr. Luxton and Mr. Simic, I, I found it quite compelling. I, I mean, these are experts, they've been doing this, they are working for the applicant, albeit, but I still find it compelling. And I think for me, uh, the decision to go forward with these, um, uh, with, 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 with it, given these issues that are in consideration, um, I, I think it's a decent proposal. And, but, but I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, I, I believe that uh, the, the gates that are being proposed and the design material we've got here are consistent with the national guidelines. Um, I, the, the argument that's been put forward to me um, was compelling. So um, I, I think we need to move forward with this. And, um, uh, and, and uh, I, I think this will come out to be a very good product that in time, the the, the I, I say this one more thing before I, I close off is that in in terms of the gate, it, it it's in keeping it's sympathetic with the house that's being designed. But I I I really feel that in time, it will blend into the neighborhood. It won't stand out like a sore thumb. I, I know sometimes it's difficult to adjust 
uh, what was there and what is new. But I do think in time, because it's sympathetic with the house and it's got characteristics that are, are, are kind of aged and rustic, uh, although modern in keeping with the house that, um, uh, in my view, it'll fit in with, but that's my subjective view. And I think that's where we're at. These are subjective views, so. Thank you very much, Council, Council, Councillor Ney. Uh, so I was hesitating. I thought I was muted for a second. Um, uh, Councillor Patterson, you, you seconded this. Anything you wish to add at this point? I, th I think we may. Uh... Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I think that um, Councillor Ney, you know, has, has, has summed this up. And I, I, I certainly appreciate uh, the comments of Dr. Prince in, in the, um, that I think we are all greatly pleased that the walls are being restored, um, which are, I think, the, the predominant visual element of, of, of the wall gate system. I do find that the applicants, uh, representatives have put forward compelling um, proposals for the materials that are that are, are used. The, the real difficulty I have with this in assessing it is we have the designed uh, gates that are proposed by the applicant um, and there is nothing within the HCA guidelines um, or, or they came forward from the Heritage Commission on the discussion of how, how you modernize the gates to retain what um, what aspects uh, were visually considered to be um, congruent to maintaining the historical aspects of the prospects with, a, with modernized gate systems and um, automated openers. And so it, it's very difficult. It, it's not like there's a choice of A or B. There is an A or back to the drawing board. And so therein lies the difficulty, I think, for council. Um, I, you know, we would have to be very specific, I think, on, on allowing something to, some statement that would say, if it is not this, then what, what is that? And, and I don't feel that I have the expertise to put forward something that is better than what is is recommended before us here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Patterson. I, I think maybe if I go to the next speakers on this, um, there are there are really three key things on here and I think maybe it's worth addressing them in terms of your alignment. The 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 motion on the floor is to approve the the design as is. I think there's there's three aspects. One is the restoration of the walls, which I think we probably have unanimous agreement uh, should be done. Uh, then it comes down to the crossing widths uh, on Prospect in York, and then it comes down to the gates uh, within those. And I think those. I think if I can maybe get comments, uh, if anybody's in disagreement on any specific aspect, this is probably helpful uh, to guide this towards a a, a, a a final resolution here tonight. So go ahead. I have uh, Councillor. Uh, Braithwaite and then Green. Um, thanks very much, Amir. I'm speaking against the motion. Um, I think that um, it, this is very difficult because, uh, you know, here you have, uh, you could have had an opportunity, I think, as Ms. Grant said, that there could have been a compromise design where the needs of the HCA would have been met and the needs of the applicant would have been met. Sadly, there isn't that um, design. And just to go to one thing that Councillor Patterson said about um, that the walls are, are at least getting fixed. I think the walls had to get fixed because the walls were broken in the course of this um, of this build. Um, so that I think that's a really important point. Um, I, I think also that um, the the gates right now are compatible to the house that is being built. Um, and I think that it was Mr. Prince who was saying that um, really we're kind of ignoring the, the gates of being part of this 120 year old wall. And so we really, we should be, we should be making the gates fit the wall, not the gates fit the house in, in is, is how I kind of took that. And, and to, to Councillor Appleton's um, point before about the streetscape that we will see with that, um, with that wall, it has to be 
the streetscape has to be sympathetic, the walls and the gates together. Um, I, I think it's as I think it's sad that we're at this point um, in this beautiful HCA where um, we have to um, now come down to, uh, to 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 looking at this set of gates that could have, in my humble opinion, been designed to fit far better within this HCA. Um, so sadly, I can't support this. Um, and um, it'll be interesting to hear what the other, my fellow colleagues have to say. Thank you, Councilor Braithwaite. I have Councilor Green and then, Al and then Appleton. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I am going to come come down on the side of not approving this motion as it stands. One of the things I would like to have seen was a referral back to the Heritage Commission. Um, my sense is that we we did not get um, wholly specific information or recommendations from the Commission. That's not their fault. Um, it's no one's fault. It's just that I was wondering if this was worth a re revisit by the Commission. Um, it took us many, many years to establish the HCA and uh, and I think uh, the Heritage Commission has been, um, as well as the neighborhood, they've, they've all been key stakeholders in, in the development of the HCA, its implementation, its adoption, and so on. Um, and the volunteers that were involved in the committee worked very hard. Um, this has been, frankly, a fraught development. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, it has been very unfortunate on many levels, I've, I feel. And um, so, at, at this point in time, my option would have been to refer this back to the Heritage Commission for comment and specific comment that, you know, that we could have laid out perhaps some direction for them. And, and conversely, they could lay out some direction for us. Um, but that is not to be. I do appreciate um, the developers teams uh, or team members rather, and, and Mr. Luxton as well. Um, I really appreciate their being here. Uh, but I guess my concern is, what does this mean for the future of HCAs in Oak Bay? Because this hopefully is the first of future um, future projects like this uh, in terms of HCAs. So the, those are the things I've been struggling with and, and I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't support the recommend, recommendation as it is, but I really appreciate the work that staff put into this because it's not an easy one and it never has been, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Um, and as we go through this, if people are speaking against, it's helpful just to give some sense of the, uh, I appreciate you stating the, the desire for further input. I think that's kind of the guidelines you want to get as we go through this, because I don't, we, we do, are going to have to have some motion to give some direction on this going forward. And so the, the more clarity we have of where people are standing, the the better off we are as we go back to, to, to pieces, because it sounds like there may be some, some inability to support the motion as it stands. I have Councillor Appleton and then Zelka. Uh, thank you, Worship. So I similarly will speak uh, against the motion on the floor. Um, and as, as you requested, uh, Your Worship, I'll try to be as clear as possible about my reasons for doing so. Um, my lack of support is focused exclusively on the design of the prospect place gates. So the gate that would face prospect place. So there are in fact two separate gates, as we know, York and prospect. My comments would focus, I, I do concur that the rehabilitation of the walls is positive. Um, I do think that the, the alteration permit could proceed given the existing or given the proposed openings in the walls. So again, focusing specifically on the design of the prospect gate. So, and, and though I, Though I appreciate the, the the comments made about national guidelines on heritage, I think it's also important to consider the specific local guidelines and our own HCA guidelines and what are the specifics of that. And as I mentioned, the, the guidelines specifically reference the prospect place gates as a distinguishing feature. So they're specifically identified in the HCA guidelines um, and that the streetscape um, as, as defined in the HCA is, is defined as a special feature the layout of the street. So proceeding from that idea, um, the guidelines do provide that new elements may, uh, well, that, hist that new elements may be supported by historical design so that historical uh, features may inform new design. And of course, this is, this is subjective. 
Um, but it seems to my um, non-specialist eye that there are potentially, uh, well, there's, first of all, there's, there's evidence and, and documented evidence of what the historical uh, gates materials looked like. Um, and that there are also ample examples of, of historical designs still present in the community that they're available and can be informative to that design. So in terms of direction, um, again, focusing specifically on the prospect gate and the importance of keeping the, that, uh, that streetscape that's specifically identified in the HCA guidelines, um, I would like to see the proposal of a specific reference to the prospect gate that the, that the materials and the design of that gate be updated and the design be made more congruent with historical design in the neighborhood um, and potentially uh, referred back to the Heritage Commission uh, for commentary on that design. So again, Your Worship, just for clarity, um, because I'm focusing specifically on the prospect gate because it's identified as a heritage feature um, and the prospect uh, streetscape identified specifically in the HCA. So it may be that the York gate is not specifically identified. So it may be that should uh, the, the will of council be to direct a potential redesign of the prospect gate, that it may be that the the landowner may choose to have the York Place gate uh, also uh, conform with that design. Uh, but again, my comments are focused specifically on the prospect gate. Thank Great. you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Councillor Appleton. Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, thank you to all my colleagues and the members of the public who've come forward with their comments. I've been finding this very uh, illuminating. Um, so I, I, I very much appreciate, um, I am speaking uh, opposed to the motion as it appears on the table. Um, and uh, uh, while I appreciate uh, the attempts to thread the needle in a very, uh, very careful and measured way, um, it doesn't satisfy um, my, my, um, my uh, I guess, subjective uh, standards in terms of uh, meeting the intent and the specifications of the HCA. Um, while I appreciate all the guidelines and I appreciate all of the attempts to, uh, to, to, to speak to specific aspects of the guidelines, uh, I like going back to some of the hard and fast rules. And I actually reached out uh, and, and reviewed very carefully and closely the actual bylaw that implemented um, the OCP amendments uh, that brought this HCA into existence. And when I review those, uh, those, uh, the actual bylaw that implemented this, um, uh, my reading shows that it makes reference to the gates in all cases. And uh, so I, in my estimation, the gates are fully uh, within the purview of this council and, uh, and for passing comments uh, thereupon. So um, um, I, uh, the question that uh, the, it, it is really not up to council to provide a design to uh, a proponent. It is, uh, it is up to council to pass judgment on designs pre presented to us. Um, and uh, as we've done in many, many cases in the past, since, uh, since the beginning of, uh, of Oak Bay, when a, a design comes to us that we have a site uh, and, and design or some other design aspects uh, that we can pass comment on, if we don't like it, we just say no. And we ask them to work with staff. Maybe we provide a little bit of input but we certainly don't redesign it for the proponent. Um, if I was going to provide input, which I, I appreciate, Chair, you've asked uh, members of council to ideally provide if we're speaking against, uh, I would like to say that I am very, um, not just grateful, but I find it uh, an absolute requirement that the walls be uh, um, restored. Um, so that would be something that I need to have in, and I'm pleased to see that, they, that that is in, into what's being proposed. Uh, the actual width of the crossing, um, that's some, an area that I possibly could have some flexibility in, possibly, but I'd like to see what, uh, what would come forward in a potentially uh, future design. But with respect to the design of the gates, as I, in my reading, see that they're fully within the purview and I am not happy with the, what's been proposed by the, um, the uh, proponent, uh, I'll be voting against um, uh, the design as presented. And I would like to see something also more congruent with the uh, original design as put forward uh, by, the, uh, I, I, um, by the original designer uh, of the uh, prospect place. 
uh, I, I didn't, yeah, excuse me. Um, so, uh, 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 Chair, I, I think you asked for uh, 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 input on the three items. Uh, um, did uh, I provide answers to the questions? You did. Thank you very much. Yeah, about forcing anybody to do that, I just think it's helpful to kind of clarify uh, motions going forward. So I am uh, risking a backlash, <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm, I am trying to provide at least some input so that I, I presume. Um, I hope that this uh, does not pass, and uh, and I hope that this does come back. I, I, I also very much appreciate the fact that the Heritage Commission voted against um, and recommended not approving, and I am very much um, uh, appreciative of their expertise on these matters. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Zalka. So I'm going to speak to the motion as it stands because I I, um, uh, I think it's important. I, I'm actually I'm. I'm you know, there's many aspects of this that I'm comfortable with. Um, so I just want to identify where I feel uh, the application. I do feel the applicant has tried very hard to come up with the design and materials that meet the, the standards. Um, very supportive of their efforts to restore the walls in a way that's it's, uh, it's in keeping with the existing uh, design and, and detailing of those walls. Appreciate the concealed wiring. Uh, certainly appreciate the attention to detail in terms of the materials. I think those are very in keeping with the, both the quality and, and, and the nature of what we're asking for. Um, certainly little details like facing the intercoms inwards uh, to keep that uh, the, the facade outside uh, looking as intact as possible. Uh, I'm actually very appreciative of the custom design work on this. I think that's very much in keeping with the uh, HCA. Uh, I think these, uh, these grand entrances and pieces uh, are deserving of something that is custom design and not just the generic uh, gate. Um, uh, and so I think we have to to uh, be appreciative of that. I actually appreciated the details from the architect as well. I I didn't I wasn't quite as aware of how transparent those gates were. I thought they were more solid in nature, and so so seeing that was was helpful. Uh, I'm also very appreciative of the low height of the proposed gates because I think uh, when we're looking at massing and, and impact of these kinds of gates, uh, the height can be quite imposing, and oftentimes we're looking at you know, seven uh, foot tall gates and these kind of entrances that, that give quite a different feel and have a the type of materials and massing uh, are differentiated based on that. Um, so, in terms of my feeling on this, I'm not I'm not as uh, probably as uh, offended by the design given those factors as I as uh, as some others uh, uh, feel that they're a little too out of keeping. Um, that being said, I do feel like the um, the design of the gates is, is largely dependent upon the. Um, I think the, the in many ways the size of the crossings is just as important as those as those details. Uh, and where I sit on that, I actually think the uh, the sixteen foot uh, entrance way on York is is totally appropriate. I think that is the grand entrance off of the Grand Street, um, and has the more formal entrance way. And so I'm very supportive of that. Um, I would much prefer that the crossing widths on the prospect side be be minimized. Uh, I think uh, if we look at that as kind of the back entrance, uh, much more informal, um, and we want to restore that wall uh, as much as possible. I think those crossings should be uh, reduced to uh, you know as long as they're functional and usable, uh, should both be kept to the to the uh, minimum size. Uh, because I think more even more than the gate, I think the size and, and massing of those gates uh, will have the most impact. And I would. You know, suggest on the on the driveway you know, more of an 11, a standard bus, you know, driveway width of more like a 10 or 11 foot gap, and on the pedestrian gate probably more like a five foot gap instead of the six foot would be more in keeping and more in scale um, for that much more rural uh, and less grandiose entrances. Um, and I, you know, it's interesting. I was, in my notes, I go back and forth a lot in terms of the design, thinking wrought iron would be better, thinking this would be better. Um, I do think that we have to give some. Uh, flexibility here. I think that the architectural integrity and differentiation from the historical is important. And I guess I just would flag on that front. This is a, a little bit different than a typical uh, HCA application. We are dealing with this in a bit of a bridge between, um, you know, for better or for worse, uh, you know, if this application had come when the gates were intact and those things were there, um, we may not like it, but certainly the reality of the situation is the those, those the departure of the gates that were there uh, happened, and the and the and the damage to the walls was done prior to the HCA coming in. So we're dealing now with the restoration, and with this after the fact. And I, I think that um, you know we, we would the guidelines as as mentioned by Ms. Grant about the repairs or reinstatement of architectural detailing is a hundred percent bang on. But I'm not I'm not 
100% convinced it also 100% applies uh, when we're actually are realistically dealing with uh, a net new. Um, we, we're not we're, we're not dealing with a restoration. We're dealing with a, a piece in there. So those are my thoughts on it. I think that uh, we're not that far off of finding something that's workable. But I do think that the scale of the entrances is probably as or more important than the specifics of the details of those of those gates. So I would be supportive of supporting the proposed width on Pro on York, but would probably prefer to see a smaller, a scaled down version of the crossings on Prospect, i.e. restoration of more of the wall. So that's where I sit on this at this point. Uh, Councillor Ney, you have your hand up again. You're muted at the moment. Hi. Thank you. Um, well, you've, um, I, I thank you for articulating all that, Mr. Mayor, because um, that all makes sense to me. I, I guess my, my final comments are, it, it sounds like this isn't going to be approved based on what the councillors have so far said, but um, you know, when I look at the objective stated in the HCA, I'm coming at this decision from the perspective of what those stated objectives were about. And um, one was that um, um, we're expected to maintain flexibility to provide for the upkeep of residents, homes and landscapes. And also, um, and also to be respectful of the contextual um, character of the of the neighborhood, and and I think on that this last point around the contextual character, that will be forever changing. As I mean, in when when I've heard some councillors say that they want this return a historical design to an original design, but. I, what what does historical design mean exactly? I, because there are houses that are of a vintage for every decade from the last 150 years. So, you know what what is considered historical, um, um, what is considered modern today will become historical in 50 years. So this, this, the nature of this neighborhood will continue to change. I mean, we, we put the HCA in to preserve some, some key characteristics of it, but, but this property was, as, as was already stated, it, it was you know, underway before the HC was in place. And so now the, the challenge is to have this property fit in with um, the existing home. So I, you know, I, I guess I'm just saying that my decision here is coming from it as far as I'm concerned is uh, is respecting what those objectives are and and, uh, and um, that's my perspective on it so thank you I'll unmute myself thank you very much Councillor Nay for those comments um, we have a motion live on the floor which is essentially to uh, move approval as as laid out here I've heard a majority of people speak against that, but their comments go forward in, in argument. So I'm not seeing any more discussion. I'm ready to call the question on that motion. Uh, and should it fail, we'll have to come back for a secondary motion, obviously. Um, so on the main question, all those in favor? Uh, Councillor Ney and all those opposed? I have uh, the plurality of Council Braithwaite, Green, Patterson, Appleton, Zelka and Murdoch opposed. So uh, moving on then to the, um, looking for another motion to give some, uh, some direction. And again, I think just in fairness to the applicant, we wanna give as clear uh, uh, a direction as possible uh, on the aspects of the, uh, of the walls and the gates. Go ahead, Councillor Green. I'll give this a, a, a shot, but I, I certainly stand to be, uh, for some help here. <laughs> um, but I, I think what I would like to do is move that this be returned to staff and then to the Heritage Commission for their commentary. And I, I know they have a meeting tomorrow apparently. So this is not an attempt to um, uh, extend this process any longer than it has to be extended, but they are having their meeting tomorrow, the Heritage Commission. But I would like them to comment specifically on the three elements of this proposal that you have so well articulated, Mayor. Um, and then I would like them to give us some very specific and detailed feedback on each of these elements. Um, we do have a commission with 
uh, longstanding expertise, um, including uh, a commission member who hails from the city of Victoria, uh, who has quite an extensive um, history in this kind of restoration. So it would be interesting, I think, and important to get the commission's feedback. So that's essentially my motion. If if you need to change it or tweak it, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I'm, 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 what I heard you say was that you would move that this be referred back to staff to work with the applicant and referred to the Heritage Commission for their comment on the wall restorations proposed, uh, the crossing widths and the gate proposed gate design. Is that is that essentially what you're looking for? Yes, thank you. Um, it, and I was just wondering, is it possible to expedite it to the commission meeting tomorrow? <laughs> it may not be, but... Well, they've seen it before, so it may be. Uh, I'm before I, uh, so I think I saw a seconder there. Thanks. Um, so I, before I take any further discussion on it, though, I do want to go over to staff because I think this is going to fall on either Miss McDougall or Miss uh, East hands to to go to the if it does go to the Heritage Commission uh, that quickly for uh, additional comment. Um, I think that I just want to make sure that's. I'm not it's saying that has to happen. I'm just curious about whether or not that's even uh, possible. So. Uh, I think, in fairness, uh, Ms. East is the consultant on hand here. I have to go to Ms. McDougall or Ms. Varela for a, for a comment in terms of uh, having this uh, brought as a late matter to the Heritage Commission tomorrow. Uh, Ms. McDougall, are you able to answer that or should I go to Ms. Varela? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I believe we could certainly um, bring the report as it's currently written to Council. We could bring that to the Commission meeting tomorrow. Uh, but staff, we wouldn't have enough time to prepare a specific memo for the Heritage Commission in advance of tomorrow's meeting at 2 p.m. No, I think that's understood. Um, you would be essentially bringing forward the comments made at this meeting to them uh, and seeking their input on those three items. Um, is there any other member of staff that wanted to comment on that? Because I just, I don't want to make a, I, I guess we're not, this doesn't say specifically it has to be tomorrow, but I just want to make sure that I, that's sort of the intent. We don't want this to, to slip in time. Um, and I'm just, okay, I'll, I'll, I have a motion and I consider it valid as a, as a reasonable way of going forward. Anything else you want to add then, Councillor Green? No, just that I do appreciate the work of everyone involved, both the applicant and our staff and so on. But I, I think it would be worthwhile to get feedback from our commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, second or head is Councillor Braithwaite. Do you have anything to add? Councillor Appleton and then the Councillor Nay. Thank you, Your Worship. So if, if I could just, as speaking as liaison to the Heritage Commission, if I could just ask for a little bit of clarification. As staff so, or as council is aware, uh, this has gone before the commission uh, before, and the commission did make uh, commentary and, and recommendation as, as is found in the staff report. I guess um, what I might ask um, in in my role as liaison, I would carry the responsibility and, and and would want to help facilitate the discussion around the commission table based on council's direction and council's dialogue. Uh, they may not have been uh, privy to the entire discussion here. So my understanding, and if I can get clarification potentially from the mover of the motion, but. Um, is to gather more information on this topic from the commission who is, who's already seen it. Um, but as you as has been laid out here, there have been three broad topics for discussion. I guess what I'm hearing is we would like feedback from the commission on where specifically this is uh, uh, not meeting objectives, I guess is what so the redesign of the walls, the uh, size of the crossing widths and the design of the gates being the three components. Are we, are we, I'm asking the question, are we asking the question of the commission to comment on which one of those is, is, is the area of concern and, how, and, and providing input on those three things specifically as to how they would be improved? Is, the, is that what we're communicating? That, that was indeed, Councillor Appleton, through you, Mayor, that was indeed my intention, that they would look at those three elements specifically and, and provide more specific feedback on each of them. I think I, if, I, if I may add to that, Councillor Appleton, um, I, I think the, um, I think 
from a heritage perspective, you know, we are interpreting both the broader heritage guidelines as well as the HCA. And so, you know, I, in the interest of giving us clear a, a direction back or consideration for by council, um, if they can provide their interpretation of those guidelines in terms of what, what they, how they would interpret those pieces, because I think we've heard some discussion here about making them more in keeping with the older styles or um, keeping them more distinct. And I think the more they can give guidance on, on, on how they think council should interpret that would be very helpful. I appreciate that your worship and that I think that that's consistent with my understanding with the objective of working towards a situation that that does work for both the applicant and is congruent with the guidelines so this is ultimately what we're what we're seeking to achieve here so um working towards identifying those things which could be improved or revised in the existing application such that it could be approved yeah and i think in fairness the heritage commission i understood it we're looking it didn't it had a missing understanding of some of the materials as they were brought forward on the gates last time and we're also sort of told that it was out of the purview to, to really speak too much to the gate design itself or to the, the, the appropriateness. So I think this is an opportunity for it to go back for that because some of that clarification. So thank you, Councillor Apple. Anything else you want to add? No, thank you, Your Worship. I appreciate that direction. I appreciate that input. Uh, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And and I could I can support definitely sending this back to the Heritage Commission. I think that uh, uh, they do um, have a lot they have certainly knowledge of the area and um what the what the intent is on on accomplishing any changes that are proposed for the area one thing that i would also like to add is that in the context of the the proposed gates that the commission reflect that the modernized use of the gates to be electronic gates as opposed to the manual operation of um, of heritage gates that are given used as examples be considered and that the the you know the commission provides some commentary on how they how they envision the um, the technology aspects and the um, the automated operation of gates versus um, the historical gates, which are predominantly manual operating in the district. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Um, I don't see any other discussion on the motion as it stands. Um, so if I may, I, I'm ready to call the question unless there's any other discussion. So hopefully we'll have this back with those that feedback and, and input from staff and the applicant back here sooner rather than later uh, based on this. Uh, so I will, don't see any other discussion. I'll call the question, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Um, I hope uh, the applicant <laughs> is able to kind of uh, make themselves available for that meeting tomorrow. I think that would be very, if that's if that's gonna able, be able to get there um, because I think it would be important to kind of get that. Um, that expertise and, and uh, around the table and, and provide some some clear guidance. Um, any other discussion on this item here tonight? All right, we'll look forward to that coming back. I think it's a uh, it has the potential of being a spectacular um, uh, improvement to where what's there right now, and uh, and uh, sort of hope to see that come back sooner rather than later. So with that, that concludes item number eleven point one. We're on to eleven point two, uh, which is the. Um, uh, council procedures bylaw meeting start times and public input um, this moved forward through first second third reading uh, at the last meeting and then went out for uh, some advertising for public input um, perhaps I'll just go back to staff at this point uh, if there's any updates in terms of uh, public input received and uh, and then we'll come back to council for uh, for consideration of whether to if there's a decision desire to amend this um, then we would go back to uh, just second reading and make amendments and have third reading again and then uh, advertise again. So that would be the process if there's any changes and if we're going to adopt it as is. Uh, and I guess there's also consideration of what works well for the group here and then uh, what might work well for future councils. Um, before I go to Councillor Braithwaite, you had a point of privilege? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to just see if you wanted me to extend the meeting by a few minutes since it's just about 10 o'clock. Yeah, let's we just do it for 20 minutes. If that's I'll make that motion. 
Moved and seconded. I'd like to thank you. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. So at worst case scenario, let's definitely get some direction here so we can move this uh, in whatever way we want. If we want more information or we want to uh, do additional. So uh, Ms. Um, Ms. Morden, I think this is, uh, or Ms. Williams, I can't remember now which is is leading on this one. Uh, perhaps you can just do a quick, uh, quick reminder of us of what this uh, bylaw amendment procedure uh, entails. Thank you, Welcome. Your Worship. Uh, it's, uh, it's Ms. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the bylaw before you, as you've noted, has already received three readings and it has gone out to public notice. Uh, staff did advertise uh, two full page ads in the uh, Oak Bay News in the local newspaper, uh, as well as using our social media channels. And the newspaper did pick up and run a story uh, on the article. We haven't received any input from the public in response to that. So just to, to recap the bylaw as it sits before you right now, uh, proposes to change the regular council and committee, the whole meeting start times from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, it proposes to set the regular in-camera meeting schedule uh, for a 5.15 p.m. start on those days that we have regular council meetings. And it increases the opportunities for public input by adding uh, a 30-minute input opportunity to all regular council meetings. Currently, those are only uh, required on committee of the whole uh, meetings. So as you've already noted, uh, if council were to adopt the bylaw tonight, we would uh, we would go out and advertise the new schedule to the public and update all of our media sites. And if council chooses to amend the bylaw, uh, we would uh, advertise in the newspaper what those new amendments are and bring it back for adoption at a later date. And I'm, I can answer any questions should anyone have any. Kevin, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, just uh, no, I think, I think you've covered it for well, well enough. Are there any other questions of, of council on this? Uh, Councilor Zelko. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I much appreciate it. And uh, uh, I, I look forward to uh, to giving it a go and, and seeing what the next uh, couple of months look like. Um, and uh, and if there's a, a members of the public who wish to, to comment, uh, with the notice that they've been given, I look forward to hearing their, their comments as well. But I do want to ask, I know we have a 10 o'clock sort of cutoff at these three council meetings, uh, and it seems to be like nine o'clock at committee of the whole, something like that, it seems to be a different time. Uh, but, but I just wanted to ask in general, whatever that time is, if we have an in-camera meeting that is going late, and then we have to sort of like uh, say, we, we would adjourn it for following a council meeting, say, and then that council meeting ends uh, abruptly because we don't extend it. Uh, what happens to the first meeting um, uh, that was adjourned? I just wanted because most likely that's going to happen. So uh, are, are, are we have two meetings hung or just one or what happens? Thank okay. you, Councilor Zalka. Yeah, let's get clarification. Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you, Mayor Murdoch, and through you to Council. Uh, that certainly would be up to Council, whatever they chose to do in that moment. So if you're in an in-camera meeting that you're not able to complete the business, you can recess the meeting to be adjourned following the open meeting. And let's just say for uh, an example that your open meeting arrives at 9 o'clock and there's a vote to not extend or there's a failed vote to extend, we would then re reconvene the in-camera meeting and council, that one is not at the time limit. It's a it's a meeting that's continued on earlier. So it could continue on and certainly any member of council could move to adjourn it if there was no desire to continue for the evening. Okay, if I may ask one last question, Chair. Of course, go ahead. So I, I the, uh, the, the, the the committee in the whole and council meetings have this this um, majority must uh, of must all agree to continue. For in camera meetings, is there also a majority uh, a must also uh, approve to continue, or do we? Is it only 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 the the, the majority have to agree? Councilor Zelka, or Council, thank you, Councilor Zelka, yeah. Ms. Williams. Just wanted to know. Sure. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the requirement in the open meeting is that it has to be a unanimous consent of all members present to continue with the meeting. The re that requirement is not there for in-camera meetings. I guess there was no anticipated over three hours for an in-camera meeting in the, in the bylaw. They, they obviously, whoever drafted that doesn't know about our meetings lately, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs>
Yeah, as Ms. Williams pointed out, there is always uh, a motion to a, to adjourn is always in order. So it's, uh, you know, if something's running long, that can always be brought. And that is a simple majority vote, not a not a unanimous vote. Uh, so just for clarification. Um, are there other questions uh, of staff on this? Um, Go ahead, Councillor Green. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say, um, you're calling, a, calling the question though, correct? Um, on adoption? I will be calling the question on adoption at this point, unless there's a motion to, to but, make an but amendment. We, but we can't speak to it at that point, can we, on adoption? Uh, uh, yes, generally speaking, we, we can. I mean, it's it's traditional on on, a, on adoption that we usually just, you know, we're, it's more, more pro forma, but because this one sought public input, and, and I think there were some members of, you know, I think all of council was looking to see if there was a strong feeling in the community to identify potential impacts of change. Uh, I'm, this gives a bit more flexibility in terms of the discussion. So, at this point, I can we're a bit informal here. At this point, I probably should be calling, the, you know, having the motion on the table and then discussing. But because if there's any motions to amend, we have to go back to second reading anyway. I figured it's better just to have the conversation. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ms. Williams, you had your hand up. Did you want to add something? I did. My apologies. As soon as I muted myself, I realized that the provision in the bylaw is to uh, not specific to open or closed meetings, but to regular and special meetings. So the three hour time limit does apply to in camera, but the time, the clock will have stopped when you recess and it will start again when you reconvene. So you could continue a full three hours of the in camera as well. Good to know. Thank you. I think in the interest of our own sanity, that's probably a good thing. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you wanted me to put um, the adoption motion on the table. Sure, it's always a uh, motion to. So, I'll move adoption order. of bylaw 4740.001-2022. Thank you, moved and seconded. Um, Councilor Green, did you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to, wanted to say a few comments. Um, I will not be supporting adoption. I, I didn't support this before as well. And that is because I feel the timing is, is wrong to make these changes. Um, I also feel that we have lost a huge segment of the population uh, through lack of engagement. That is no one's fault. That is uh, COVID driven, certainly. Um, but I also am mindful that six o'clock is dinner time. It's a dinner hour for working people in particular, um, people with young families. And I think it's, it's, it's going to be a hardship for them to try and get to these meetings. Um, so those are my comments and I, I'm not saying anything new. I think I expressed these feelings before. I would like to have seen more engagement with the community at large um, around this issue. And I just don't think we're gonna get the feedback right now under all the circumstances. And, you know, waiting to do this perhaps for the next council felt like the right thing to do. And I, I believe Councillor Appleton and I were both feeling that way, but I will let him speak for himself. Thank you. <laughs> that's, always, that's always appropriate, Councillor Appleton. No, I thank you, Your Worship, and I appreciate you taking comments um, at, at adoption. We're not typical, um, and Council has heard my thoughts on this. Um, I feel that I remain feeling very strongly that a change in time uh, disempowers and makes it more difficult for a certain segment of the population to access meetings, and I'm not comfortable with that. So and I, I do appreciate staff's efforts to put out the, the engagement with the public and to inform the public. I, I do believe the public has been well informed. Um, but as Councillor uh, Green has alluded to, I believe that we sit in a spot where we are fairly disconnected with the public after a number of years of, of COVID. And um, they may not be in the, in the frame of mind to provide comments about that one specific item. So um, I have significant concerns about the change and I'm not supporting the motion on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Um, I have Councillor Patterson and then Braithwaite. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I, I won't go, go over everything that has already been stated by Councillors Green and Councillor Appleton. I did state it the first time around. I also feel that, that uh, this is not the time to make this change. I think that it does need greater assessment um, from the community because six o'clock in my mind is, is the dinner hour. I am also, um, I'm also cognizant of the fact that 
that often the matters that we deal with as a council in camera um, take thoughtful consideration and, and splitting the meeting is not, in my opinion at least, always the, um, the best way of doing that. And I think that, that uh, because of the change in times that will occur more frequently in the future. So I, I, I don't support the motion as, uh, as it's proposed. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Councillor Braithwaite? I yeah, just really briefly. I, 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 the reason I am supporting the motion is because I, I think that it, it is a good time actually to, to make a change because we have had really no ability to meet, meet um, with the public over the past year and a half, two years. And so really for them, it's, it, 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 it's just a, a time that is being put on the table. It's six o'clock now and it, it hopefully will be six o'clock now rather than seven o'clock. And I also think that if, if, if we as a council and this particular council here doesn't feel that this is working within the next two months, three months, we can actually change it back. We have that power. So that's why I feel comfortable supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Any other discussion on this? Go ahead, Councillor Ney. Oh, you're muted. I am going to be in support of this. And uh, my the, my reason is, um, I, I actually, it's similar to Councillor Braithwaite's. It's, uh, if the majority of us agree to this now, we give it a shot. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't, you know, if we feel some significant part of the community is being ignored, the next council will know that and they can uh, amend this bylaw as, it's, as, as they see fit for, um, uh, for, for, for the duration of their, for the duration of their term. So I, I, I'm okay with it. So I'll, I'll hold in support of it. Thank you very much, Councillor Ney. I, I've been on the fence on this one. I have to say, I think there's, I can see the pros and cons of both. I'm actually really hesitant to make changes to a bylaw that we're at such a close, uh, it, it, there's a, it's not a, a clearer mandate from the, from the council. Um, so I was, I'm, I'm, I'm torn on this one a little bit. I think at the end of the day, I will support this. I do think we need to, to, to have a, a review of it after a couple of months and just sort of see how it's working. I, I can really see that the, the short time between the in camera and the start of the of the council meeting is just going to be unworkable. Uh, that we need to have that gap to start at seven, um, but I'm okay to try it and see how it goes. And I think some of the other housekeeping things, like the addition of the, um, the you know the, the other sort of fixes and the procedures by law and adding in the the public uh, input pieces, are obviously very important uh, parts of this. So. Um, uh, given this is the, the the piece that we've the majority direction, I'm, I'm supportive. I do think that we have to look at it and see what the impact is. My my gut feeling is that we're going to find it's just a little bit too tight. Uh, that the five fifteen and the six o'clock start times are just a little too tight. Um, but I could I stand to be uh, corrected in my assessment based on on actual trial and error, and uh, and uh, and move it forward with that. So I'll support the uh, the adoption and definitely look forward to seeing how it's working and I think we want to be nimble if it's not working well that we we adjust it again but I think the all the pieces together on this one uh, are really uh, worthwhile to, to try so um, there we go uh, there's still two hands up is there anybody else that wishes to speak or are they just lingering from before I think they're just lingering okay so uh, I'm the motions on the floor right now for adoption I'll call the question all those in favor and opposed I have Councillor Green, Patterson, and Appleton uh, in opposition. Uh, that does carry. Um, I think we just stay on our toes on this one and, 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 and keep an eye and see how it's working. Um, is there any new business? Don't see any new business. Hands going up. So we've dealt with number 13, 13.1 already earlier in the meeting. And so we're really just down to the adjournment motion at this Move point. Adjournment. Moved and seconded. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, all of eight minutes left before we have to get off of here because our, our extension. Um, I just want to uh, express my appreciation to all the members of council for, uh, for getting through this and getting to all of the agenda items tonight. So uh, it was a bit of a tight one uh, for sure, but I uh, appreciate that. We will see you all on Thursday for the uh, budget meeting. I'll call the question for an adjournment. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed, that carries. We'll see. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite, you had a question? Sorry, do we not have another meeting this week also, or has that been canceled? Uh, the Wednesday meeting may or may not happen. So we're just, okay. uh, yeah. 
Uh, that's Thank an in-camera meeting, but we'll certainly see you all here and in public mm -hmm. on Thursday for the budget. And again, uh, we'd Valentine's. encourage all members of public to, uh, to participate if they wish uh, at that budget meeting on Thursday. Good night, everyone. Good night and happy Valentine's. Happy, happy, Valentine's. happy Valentine's. It's speed dating. Bye. Bye, everyone. Recording stopped.